So exactly what is malware? Well, let's break it down and cue my rap music. Well, to make this easy, malware is simply a piece of software or a computer program that's used to perform malicious actions or attacks on a target. Now, even its name should give away what it's going to do. We take malicious plus software, and that's how we get malware. Now, as far as the attacker is concerned, our overall goal is to infect any device. There's malware not just out there for computers and laptops, but for phones, for tablets. The mobile industry is huge with malware right now. Once installed, the attackers can potentially gain total control over your devices, or at least over the data on your devices. Now, many people have the misconception that malware is a problem only for Windows, but Technically, attackers really don't care. They're going to affect any computing device, including our tablets, smartphones. So any person, company, or device is a target. Hello? I mean you. The more computers and devices that an attacker can infect, the more money they can make. In fact, they really don't care who they infect as long as they infect as many devices and people as possible because it's a numbers game. And guess what? It comes in various forms. Again, malware is just a categorization of security threats. And again, we will break those down as we get further in. Now, some of the goals of malware includes the ability to steal data off your machine, customer lists, accounting data. We can maybe harvest usernames and passwords. Not just yours, but anybody who's been on that machine. Now, usually about this point, I hear somebody say, uh, Dale, I'm broke. I really don't care if they steal my data. They can have my bank account. Well, guess what? I may not be after you financially. I could be after your resources. I may be looking into building a botnet, and I need computing power to go after Citibank because that's going to be financially beneficial to me. And of course, if someone backtracks it, they're going to come to you. And this is again where I will say you have the obligation to make sure that your machine is not compromised for the safety of others. Now, the people who create, deploy, and actually <laughs> benefit from malware can range from the whole scope of individuals who are just trying to hack their own internal network to organized crime. Folks, this is big money. As well as, yep, guess what? Government organizations. And in fact, this is such a big I'm going to use air quotes here, business, that people that are creating these sophisticated malware products are often dedicated just to that purpose. And it actually ends up snowballing because if I can get one piece of malware installed on you, I can use it to add additional pieces of malware. And again, this is so profitable here, folks, is that it actually becomes the full-time job. And you may be thinking, well, how do they make money off of this? Well, first of all, once they've developed and deploy their malware, they often then sell all the machines that they've infected to other individuals or organizations. And those individuals then go through and start installing more pieces of malware. And that's again where the snowball comes into play. And we end up eventually your machine being a member of a botnet. Now, this botnet is basically a mishmash of systems out there that are totally controlled by the attacker. And the botnet can be remotely controlled, which cyber criminals then go and use for their purposes, or they again may sell it to other cyber criminals. So again, the reason why we see such a big influx right now of malware is because it is so stinking profitable. And quite frankly, it should be a pain in your rear end, or should I say assets. So why is malware so popular? Now, let's take a look at some of the numbers behind it. Now, the recent attacks with Target, Home Depot, Sony Pictures, those breaches are just examples of how destructive malware can be to an organization's reputation and their stability. Now, there's an organization that's called Pullman Institute, which conducted research so they could see how much money people were spending or I should say companies are spending on protecting themselves. And let me tell you, I might be in the wrong business after seeing some of these numbers. The first is this, is that only approximately 4% of all malware alerts are investigated. On average, organizations get about 17,000 malware alerts weekly, but only 19% of the alerts are deemed to be reliable. 
and we start to see false positive hit us all the time, what ends up happening? Yeah, we start to ignore it. So the study actually suggests that organizations, one, don't have the resources, or two, the in-house expertise to take a look at what's hitting them. The study also showed that companies spend a ton of money, over a million dollars annually, trying to protect their environment. And yet they're only investigating 4%. Tell you what, those are numbers that I think are unacceptable. And one of the biggest concerns that we have is, and we can't do anything about this, but over 300 million pieces of malware were created just in 2014. And believe it or not, the trend that we're seeing shows that we're getting about a 44% increase year over year. And one of the biggest reasons for that is this. Yeah, mobile is huge right now. Now, when it comes to malware, it's important to note this. Some companies, software companies, knowingly put malware in their products or what we would classify as malware. Have you downloaded an application for your phone or your tablet? And typically it has in there what permissions you gave, give access to that particular application. I'd like to install a game and I want them to have access to my contacts. Are you kidding me? Now I could go on and on about mobile, but we have a dedicated course coming out just for that niche of the market. Uh, yeah, but deal, we're okay because we use a lot of virtual machines. Well, guess what? 28% of the malware products out there are VM aware. And the numbers just keep getting worse and worse, at least in my book. The study also shows that as far as administrators, they interviewed a bunch of administrators, and they report that 75% of the malware that comes in their environment is installed by end users, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. And I bet at a personal level, it's probably a higher number. But of the administrators that were a part of the study, 71% said that they had devices or programs in place to help protect their environment. Okay, well, those are pretty good numbers. Now, guess what? Only 39% and less said that they audited those protection devices and software programs. Now, guess what? Only 39% audited the devices that were in place to protect them less than once a year. That's where I want to slap my hand against my forehead. Are you kidding me? And guess what? At the end user level, it's even worse. End users, their biggest fears, and see if this doesn't fall into your lap here. 60% say that they're afraid of a loss of data. We hear about identities being stolen all the time. Many times they're just given up by the user. They just are being socially engineered to either install a piece of malware or just to give the information out because the malware makes them think that they're updating their antivirus. 51% are afraid of online fraud. I would have thought that was a little bit bigger, but there may be a lot of people that are too old. Don't worry about that internet stuff. But regardless, this is the shocker for me. You ready? Yeah, guess what? 43% don't install security updates. I don't know how many times I go to, at a personal level, family members and at a business level to different companies. And I'm like, how come you haven't done your Windows updates? Didn't know if I should install them. They're called security updates, folks. So I'm going to go back and let me give you an analogy. You went off and just bought a brand new BMW. Do you just start driving it around and not care about it? Or do you read the owner's manual? Do you learn about every little thing that this expensive device, a car, will do and can do for you? Yet today we go off and buy smartphones and tablets and just start doing our banking on it, installing all kinds of applications because, hey, it's cool. Or worse yet, we just start downloading pirated software. Oh yeah, I'm going to go there. Listen to me very carefully here, folks. You wanting to save $39 on an application by pirating it? Trust me, you're going to spend more than $39 trying to fix your identity. I know I'm being really serious. You guys are used to me being jovial and happy. But it really becomes hard for me when I see people be so complacent. And to be quite honest, so lazy. But hey, I call it job security. Okay, Dale, but how does malware get in? Well, that's a great question. We've already talked about how the standard user actually brings in a majority of it. But malware itself can actually be broken down into two different types. One of these is viruses, which requires human assistance, meaning I have to actually execute the file in order to get infected with the virus. We also see worms. Now, worms are automatic. They typically, as far as propagation is concerned, they don't need any human interaction. That's why they're called a worm. They start squirming throughout your network infrastructure and infecting more and more targets all on their own. 
The other type of malware that we see is referred to as concealment malware. And we've talked about some of these. These are ones that actually hide themselves. We talked about rootkits back in system hacking. But basically the concept behind the rootkit is that it's designed to hide itself by modifying the OS so it's not visible to the end user. The other type is called a Trojan. And a Trojan is simply a code that's been hidden inside of a file that you want to get. And we'll get into more Trojans in the next module. Now, when it comes to malware, this is typically deployed by what we refer to as an insider attack. An insider attack is a security breach that's caused or implemented by someone who's a part of the organization. And that could be an employee, a contractor, or yeah, believe it or not, even IT personnel, including developers. And the reason why I include developers is because developers have this tendency, or any, again, it can be anybody in IT technically, they will create what we refer to as backdoors. A backdoor, which we also sometimes call a trapdoor, is simply a hidden feature or possibly a command that allows the user to actually implement a hidden feature. So the application itself would be used as normal, it performs as expected, unless somebody activates the back door, in which case the hidden feature gets activated and then the program does something that's totally unexpected or something you weren't aware of what it would do. Kind of like a Easter egg. Have you ever seen an Easter egg on DVDs or on a piece of software? Like Android's been doing Easter eggs for a long time where you can go in and look at the settings for your Android device, go down and tap rapidly on the version of Android. If it's Jelly Bean, then all of a sudden a bunch of Jelly Beans show up with little happy smiley faces. Now that's not anything destructive. It's just showing you that again, here I am inside of settings and there's a hidden feature there that again, if I activate the hidden feature, I get a little animation out of it. Now we also have something that's called a logic bomb. A logic bomb is based off of the fact that this piece of malware is going to activate itself based off of what we refer to as a logical condition. Does anybody remember the movie Superman 2 with Richard Pryor? Okay, there's your next homework assignment. No, I won't torture you. It was really a bad show. But in the movie, Richard Pryor decides to go and learn about computers and he becomes this big computer expert. And he figures out a way with all this money that's being transferred between banks, he's working for the bank, that he could just round up the cents between all these different transactions. And he would take the difference between the actual transaction and the rounding up and take that rounded up number and move it into his own account. And he ended up having hundreds of thousands of dollars. And back in the 80s, that was a lot of money. Well, that was a logic bomb that was going off because whenever a transaction took place, this actually took place. Many times we see it based off of time and date. And a great example of that is the famous Omega bomb. No, I'm not talking about some superhero's bomb. Omega Man! Now, this was a case back in 1996 that took place with Omega Engineering. This was actually the first federal computer sabotage case that took place. Now, what happened is there was a gentleman by the name of Timothy Lloyd, who was a network manager and administrator for Omega Engineering. And what was happening is he started getting written up for performance issues. And so he started looking for another job, but he was getting a little upset. And so what he decided to do was to create a logic bomb. He first went through and created a user account that was called 12345 that had no password and had full administrative rights. Now, Omega Engineering had the policy that all employees were to save their data, their work, all their documents to a centralized file server. And their policy he said that they could not make their own backups. So he developed this logic bomb on his own workstation and then moved it to the server when he realized that he was probably going to be fired. Now, he also went and requested a backup tape from HR of all the data, and it was the most recent backup. He then went through and his logic bomb that he wrote basically said that if his account did not log in after 20 days, then to execute the following command. And it was simply to switch over to the network drive, which was the F drive, log in with a username of 12345, no password, change into the directory of public, and then run a program called fix.exe. Now this fix.exe program 
was actually Diltry from the old DOS days, which allowed an administrator to delete files. And as it deleted, it first asked, are you sure you want to delete? And then on the screen, it would say deleting. Well, he went through and changed it. So instead of deleting, it said fixing. And he said to delete everything, he used a slash Y option, which means it didn't prompt the user, are you sure you want to do this? It just did yes. And then he did a wild card, which means to delete everything. And finally, he issued a purge command, which basically makes it so that the files can't be recovered from backup. And to, quote, cover his tracks, he also erased the backup tapes. Now, here's the real kicker is Omega Engineering did business with the United States Navy and NASA. So the Secret Service got involved on this one, folks. And when they raided his home, they found the same logic bomb on his computer where he'd been playing around with it, as well as that's where they discovered the tapes had been erased. Now, financially, Omega spent nearly $2 million to try to repair the programs and lost nearly $10 million in sales, which led to over 80 people being laid off. Mr. Lloyd was convicted of computer sabotage and was sentenced to 41 months in federal prison. Whoa, so how did these pieces of malware get in here? Well, there's several different methods for a piece of malware to get into your environment. One of them is untrusted sources for software. Not just, again, our desktop platforms, but also our mobile devices. Just this week, Apple announced that as many as 4,000 apps were infected by the Xcode Ghost malware product. But when you're searching for a piece of software for your PC, say for example, WinZip, are you actually going to winzip.com or are you just doing a Google search and clicking on the first link? Well, that first link may not be the actual vendor. And so you install that piece of software. And of course, whenever end users see a pop-up like this, they always hit yes. They never hit no. Why? Because they want the software. Another way that we get in is through installation. There are many times that I go to install a program and I always select custom install. I never do a basic. I'm always watching and I never go click, 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 click. I take my time because many times the application or the vendor is generating additional revenue by installing toolbars on your PC, which then can lead to other malware infecting you. Another way is through, again, propagation. Once you get one, I guarantee you're going to start getting more. Another way is simply by not updating or running any type of anti, I call it anti-ware, antivirus, anti-malware. Antiviruses can't necessarily get all the malware and all the malware can't get all the antivirus stuff. So not updating that stuff and running it is a huge detriment. Okay, Dale, I believe. Give me a sign. Okay, well, I'll give you a sign. Go look at your processes running on a system that you suspect is having an issue. One, does it have an icon associated to it or is it just a process that's running? Also look at the description. Any reputable process, when the developer creates it, will list a description with it. Does the application itself or the process running live inside of the Windows or user profile directory? Because guess what? Those directories are accessed by any user on the device. Are there any weird URLs in their strings? Especially if somebody sends you a link. Oh, folks, trust me on this one. Be careful about the latest trend where people are creating shortcut links to websites. I'll show you what I mean here in just a second. And also look for any open TCP IP endpoints where your machine's just listening on a port that you can't explain. Let me show you what I mean. So I've jumped out here to my server 2012 R2 box and I'm gonna simply open up the task manager. Now the task manager has come a long way. I'm gonna select more details. Microsoft a couple of years ago went through and bought out Sys internals and they included a product which I still love to use to this day. It's called Process Explorer. And they've incorporated some of those same concepts here in the latest task manager. But I'm gonna go here under my details tab. I'll make this biggie size so we can see it. This is what I mean is first of all, I always sort by my PID and anything over 2000 in the PID is launched after the operating system fires up. And so that's when I would need to pay special attention. Now I mentioned in the slides that you should check out the description. Notice the descriptions. Most of these make sense of what they are and what they're doing. I will also take one if I don't know, for example, what this particular product does, right click on it and open the file location. Where is it going? 
Well, look, it's inside of the System32 directory inside of Windows. I might actually even drill into that application by going into its properties and looking at the Details tab, which gives me more information. You can see here it's done by Microsoft in case they haven't listed anything in the Details tab, or I should say Details column. Now, notice the ones without icons. Well, these are basically applications that are running in the background to support the OS. That's why they don't have a typical icon associated to them. I would be very suspicious if anything above 2000 didn't have an icon. You can also right click on select to search online, which will open up your most current browser. And this computer's not hooked up to the internet, but based off your search preferences, it would take you and look for that particular product. And many times you'll be able to tell what that product is. So I can quickly tell here, I don't have any treats. I mean, threats, I'm getting hungry. So in this module, we went through and took a look at several things. We first went through and took a look and talked about what was malware. Again, there's different categories of it. And that's what this whole course is about, is taking a look at the different types, Trojans, viruses, worms. We also took a look at the numbers behind malware. It's extremely financially beneficial to attackers or even companies. Again, if I can create an application that you really like and I can get you to install a toolbar that I get a residual income from because you installed it, then hey, I'm making more money. And if you don't believe me, ask Java why they want you to install the Yahoo toolbar while you're installing their product. We then went through and took a look at how malware gets in. There are several channels email, applications, there are several of those. Untrusted sources, we talked about not updating your anti-wear during installation. We talked about propagation. Once you get one, you will get more. We also talked about insider attacks and how some of the malware isn't executed immediately. It could be a logic bomb and go off based at a certain time and date or based off of a certain action. So go ahead and click stop on this video and see what happens. <laughs> so what is a Trojan? Well, that's an easy one. Basically, a Trojan, they defined it as some type of malicious software that is disguised or included with a legitimate piece of software. It's, it's hiding inside. And the reason why we hide it is because it's very easy to install. Typically, again, remember we've talked in the past about how the easiest way to get something done is to have the user do it for us. Now, when it comes to Trojans, some people get this confused. This is Sparta. Oh, wait, wrong civilization. No, the concept of a Trojan horse gets its background, obviously, from the Greek mythology about the Trojan War, where the Greeks attacked the city of Troy, and the end of the war came with a final plan that the Greeks came up with, that they would build a giant hollow wooden horse, and for some strange reason, they are sacred to Trojans, and the hollow horse was filled up with soldiers. The Trojans brought the horse into the city, and when they went to bed, the soldiers came out, including Brad Pitt, all glistening, and they sacked the city. And that's basically the same concept here, is that we're going to have a legitimate program, but our Trojan will contain some type of spyware, a keylogger, a rootkit, or some other type of program that we can use to get back in. But we're going to, again, have the victim bring the horse or the software into their computer. Once executed, the Trojan can relay information or even just steal the data outright. Now, as far as the life cycle of a Trojan is concerned. We first start off by creating what we refer to as the payload. The payload is going to be that program that we are going to design to do some specific things, maybe phone home. Yeah, I'm not gonna do that joke, that's, that's too easy. But come on, you were all thinking about ET, weren't you? Or go through and find credit card numbers or personal information. Anyway, this payload, we're gonna create it. And after we create it, we then take our legitimate program, like hmm, Office. Mm, how about the latest version of Windows or an MP3, a movie? Oh, my favorite, antivirus. And let's inject the payload inside the legitimate program. Then all we need to do is put it out there. And we'll do that via BitTorrents, websites, possibly a USB drop. I know that kind of sounds top secret, doesn't it? 
That's where we just drop a USB thumb drive somewhere in the parking lot of a company or in the hallway of a company and see who plugs it in, or even possibly IRC channels. This transmission method relies heavily on a social engineering concept, which is, I want something for nothing. So let's say that Microsoft just released the latest version of Office 2016, and I see it up on a torrent site, and I download it, and I install it. First of all, why did somebody put that up on a torrent? I know some of you guys are going to say, because they feel that all software should be free. Yeah, I'm sure that's the only reason why they're doing it. After you download it, again, you just simply install the program. And because you're installing the application, the Trojan actually gets the same permission as the user that's currently logged in. It can then go through and start modifying itself. There's actually Trojans that will morph themselves so they're harder to detect transmit themselves and start infecting other nodes inside of your environment. So you've heard me say this before, and trust me on this one, guys. I have a, again, here comes my air quotes. I have a good friend, happens to be a Batman fan, who used to be like the biggest pirate out there. But becoming an ethical hacker changed my friend's perspective on this. Because one, he started to notice some of the things that indicate that you are infected with a Trojan. So saving $39 from having to buy antivirus to download a pirated version of antivirus or the latest, I don't know, Beyonce album. I promise you, you're giving up more than that $13 for an album or $39 for a piece of software. I don't care if it's Office where you're paying $300 full retail for the product. You'll spend more time and more money cleaning up after your mess. So what's the goal when it comes to what the Trojan creator's after? Well, initially he's after an end game and the end game includes any of the following as well as a combination. The first thing that he or she may be after is to disable your firewall. Have you seen that before where your firewall won't enable? Uh, no, Dale, because I disable it anyway. Yeah, that's smart. I know, firewalls make it harder for us to configure things. But again, here comes that complacency issue or laziness. Another in-game option would be to replace or delete operating system files. If I can replace with my Trojan an operating system file that does the exact same thing that that operating system file did, for example, let's say Notepad. If I can replace it with my own version of Notepad, and that's kind of actually a bad example, but you'll get the concept here, because I would technically want to do an executable that's used all the time in the OS. But if I was to infect Notepad, and every time you launched it, my Trojan would repopulate out, especially if you've deleted it. Or, again, if I'm trying to be destructive, I might delete some very important operating system files. Another goal might be to open up a back door. Creating a Trojan, putting it on the internet, and somebody launching it, opening a back door, in many cases, actually gets rid of all the issues of having to go do reconnaissance and footprinting. Another goal that we might look at is I'd like to disable your antivirus. I don't want to be detected. And when I say disable, both on the firewall and the antivirus, I'm talking about you cannot enable it. In fact, one of the famous tricks is to take the icon for the antivirus. Most antivirus, when it becomes disabled, you get a specific looking icon. Remember, replace and delete OS files. How about if I just replace the disabled antivirus icon with one that looks like it's enabled. Ooh, yeah, thinking now, aren't you? Another goal that we might try to accomplish would be to turn the target into a proxy so that I can then issue attacks on other machines within your network, and you just think that it's Dick Grayson's machine creating the traffic on your network and grabbing up stuff. I might also even go down the road of eh, adding you to my botnet. Now, if you're not familiar with a botnet, do yourself a favor and do some Googling. Well, I'll give you the breakdown. A botnet is simply an army of systems that I, as an attacker, have infiltrated and taken control of. And at a specific time and date, I can have all of my botnet members do a specific command, such as attack Citibank or send out spam email messages. And here's the real kicker. I'm going to do this late at night when you're asleep and your system's just sitting there. Some other goals that we could accomplish as a Trojan creator would also include generating bogus traffic on your network to create a denial of service attack. Because again, remember, sometimes the motivation of the attacker is to cause disruption. Many times that disruption is designed to create problems for that company other times, it actually could open up vulnerabilities if I overload the system with too much traffic. We could also use it to download and install additional spyware 
malware and adware. Think about the toolbars that are out there that you've seen. Every installation of a toolbar, let's say for example I go to install WinZip and during the installation it says, hey, would you like to use a custom install or the quick and easy install? Please, whatever you do, don't ever choose a quick install. Don't be lazy. Take the custom so you can see what's happening. But let's say that you do select the quick install. Well, the quick install also says, please install XYZ toolbar. Well, I probably get an affiliation fee for every installation of the XYZ toolbar and all the traffic that it generates. So that's why it's money making for the attacker. So if I can get you to install additional spyware and malware, sometimes not even without your knowledge, I'm going to make more money. I always love this one. This guy's getting rich. I mean, who doesn't need 17 toolbars? Another goal could include grabbing screenshots, especially when you log on to a financial website. I can also go through as an attacker and get my Trojan to start recording video from your webcam. Yeah, but DL, uh, I got a light on my webcam, I'd be able to tell. No, guess what, I, I can turn the light off. And if you don't think that's dangerous, ask Miss Teen USA, who unknowingly opened up now, I'm not going to say unknowingly because she opened it up on her own accord. She opened up an email and clicked on the link. She'd been socially engineered to click on the link, installed black shades. The attacker then proceeded to capture video from her laptop of her during some personal moments. The attacker then tried to extort her by saying, look, here are the pictures I've captured of you, and for a nominal fee, I won't reveal them to the rest of the world. Uh, GTL, that uh, sounds like a sophisticated uh, organized crime attack. Uh, no, not actually. It ended up being a 19-year-old former classmate of hers from high school. And yes, he was arrested, charged with multiple crimes, not only for extortion, but yes, taking control of someone else's computer remotely without their permission is a federal crime. Another goal could also include, obviously, stealing passwords, codes, financial data, personal data. In fact, one of the things that I would do with my Trojan, if I had one would be to search your computer for any document that was named password or passwords or PWDs because most IT guys will go through and write down their passwords digitally. I love it when you IT guys do that. I'll also look for documents that may be, oh, network layout or Excel spreadsheets that are called user accounts or employee information. Yeah, all of you right now are quickly typing on your computers to rename all your files, right? <laughs> we could also go through and obviously use you for a target for spamming. If all else fails, I'm going to use your resources to, hey, send my Trojan to eh, all your Outlook clients. You guys have never gotten that email from a friend, right? Found a cool link. Click here. And guess what? Somebody got pwned. So now you understand the goals. Here's the bad news. This whole time you've been watching this video, I've been injecting Yo, never mind. So how do Trojans communicate and hide? Well, let's take the hiding mechanism first. When you go through and build a Trojan, again, remember, we're going to be attaching it to a legitimate piece of software. So technically, there are two different components to a Trojan, or I should say two different communication paths. The first one is called an overt channel. Now, if you were to define overt, you would describe that as something explicit or evident or obvious. So overt would be something like the newest version of Office or an MP3 file. It's the file that everybody wants. That's the overt channel. This channel, I have to make it enticing for you to want to install it. And this is what happens with malware, why there's so many pieces of it out there nowadays, is because one day everybody could want the latest version of Office. The next day, hot pictures of Dale come out and everybody wants to delete them. Or the latest game comes out. Or, hey, how about a screensaver? Listen, I'm a big Batman fan. You guys know that about me. Maybe I find a cool Batman screensaver that I'm going to go download. Well, again, that's going to be our overt channel. Now, the other channel that we deal with with communication is the illegal side. This is called the covert channel. It's the hidden path that is used to transfer data across the network. And it's going to be built into our payload. Most attackers will rely on a technique that we refer to as tunneling so that it's not visible to somebody monitoring the network that information is leaving your environment. Maybe I tunnel it across, oh, HTTP or HTTPS so you can't see it. At least anybody monitoring the network, it gets encrypted. 
you may want to make sure you understand the two differences between these channels for your immediate future. Wink, wink, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Now, if you've followed my courses, you know that I can't get across to one course without using my favorite word. And here we go. There is a plethora. Notice how I rolled my tongue on that one. <laughs> there is a plethora of ports that are used by different Trojans. And this is just a partial list. You'll notice that some of them actually utilize ports that you would not suspect. For example, port 21 for Blade Runner. Typically, that's FTP. Port 80, the Executioner Trojan uses that one. Huh, what else runs on port 80? I think one of my favorites and very appropriately named, port 666. That's Satan's back door. So when we talk about understanding the ports that are being utilized, again, this is just a partial list. You need to be doing research and finding out the newest Trojans, what ports that they are utilizing. And when you see the traffic going across that port, you need to investigate. Yeah, I know that's hard, especially in port 80, right? Now, one of the things you would definitely want to do if you suspect a system of being infected by a Trojan is to do a fresh reboot of the system and see which ports are currently listening. There's actually different states for ports. When a port is in the listening state, it's there because the system put it in that state to listen or it's waiting to make a connection to another system. Let me show you here. So I'm doing a fresh restart of my Server 2012 R2 box. Let's go ahead and go full screen on this bad boy and we'll go ahead and log in here. Don't tell anybody my password. Change the view. Okay, so I'm gonna come in here. I'm just gonna open up a command prompt. Let me back up here. So I'm going to do a net stat, and let's throw a question mark at it so you can see the different options that you have. The most important, or one of the more important ones, is this dash A, which displays all connections and listening ports. You also want to pay attention to the B, which displays the executable involved for creating that connection or listening port. So let's give that a shot. Let me scroll down here, and I'm going to do a net stat dash AB, and a whole bunch of information is going to go by, so I'm going to use a pipe with a more command, which basically says, when I fill up the screen, please pause and wait for me to hit the space bar or any key to continue. So I'll hit enter, and you'll see here that it goes through and shows me the ports as well as the executable that's associated to it. Now you'll notice here that I do have a port 80, and my warning here would be this. It cannot obtain ownership information. Now, because this is a clean machine, I'm suspecting it's my IIS that's answering any request for a web page. But you'd want to go through, and I'm going to continue through here. I'm going to scroll up here now, and you can see that there are several different executables using different ports. So I would be very suspicious of anything that says I cannot obtain ownership information. Now, with SVC host... This is a process that's on your computer that hosts or contains other services that Windows uses to do what it needs to do. For example, Defender uses a SVC host process. So that's probably why I can't figure it out, but I would still want to be very, very cautious about this. Let me clear this out, and let me show you another one. This is a netstat aon and again, I'm going to pipe this to more. This is going to give me a list a little bit laid out a little bit better, but it also includes the PID. And this takes an extra step, but again, I'm a big fan of this one just because of the aspect of, I've mentioned before, you should be aware of anything that's above 2000 in the PID. And what I could do, let's say that, for example, the 1792, uh, it was a good year. You'll notice here that it's using a port. Well, what I'd want to do is come down here, open up my task manager, go to my details, sort by the PID, and look at 1792, which tells me it's a process that's for Windows service. You could also right-click on the process, as I showed you before, and open up the file location to see where it's executing from. Now, in this case here, again, it's SVC host. We know that's supposed to be in the Windows System 32 directory, but if it was something like, oh, well, if you haven't heard this story, back when I had my ISP, we had a customer who had a FTP, pirated FTP server up and running, unbeknownst to him. He had gotten hacked, and the executable, they called it SVC hosts. It was plural, not singular, and it was actually executing from the recycle bin. So again, in the words of G.I. Joe, knowing is half the battle. So how can you actually tell if you have a Trojan? Well, it's kind of like saying, how do you know when you're getting sick? 
there's always symptoms, right? Well, when it comes to a Trojan, I refer to them as a, uh-oh, this is way too late, you're already infected. Some of the symptoms could include your antivirus is being disabled, and you can't enable it. In fact, I've seen Trojans that have gone through and made it so you can't do your updates through Microsoft Updates. Or you can't launch Task Manager to see what processes are running. Or you can't edit the host file. Every time you try to open up a command prompt, it shuts right back down. You also might see things like the control delete keys stop working altogether. And what will be funny is the user will just simply reset the PC. And when they get to a login, the control delete screen works there. But as soon as they get in, it stops working. And they think that there's something wrong with the software. You could also see the fact that the system just restarts and shuts down all by itself. I bet about 80% of you right now are going, huh. Another symptom would be, that your screensaver just arbitrarily changes, maybe to something that you would never have chosen. Some other symptoms also include things like the taskbar just eh, disappearing on you. Now this could actually be caused by a Trojan or possibly even just me visiting you. I think I'm a, I think I've shared this one with you too before. Is that uh, I think I'm a wanted man at the local Sam's Club and Costco because when I get bored, my wife drags me off there to go shopping and I do all the free samples. Which by the way. Think about it. The free samples are nothing but socially engineering you. But when I get bored, I'll go over to the computer section and I'll start playing around with some GPO settings to take away the taskbar, take away the start button. So it's also knowing what's going on with the system. In the employee break room, there's probably a security photo of me that says, watch out for this guy. One of my favorite things to do still is to do a print screen of the desktop, save that as the background, then hide all the icons, except for the recycle bin. Another symptom could be that, you know, you turn on the machine and the screen comes up and all of a sudden it starts flipping around or inverts. It could also be a symptom of the background changes. There you are working in your operating system, everything's working fine, and then all of a sudden your background changes. Okay, that seems kind of destructive there. Let's Oh, it's a cute little puppy. Well, you may think it's cute when it happens, but you got to find out why it happened. Couldn't leave you with doom and gloom. Another symptom could be that the start button, again, as I mentioned before, that it could disappear as well. Imagine the frustration when you take away the start button and the taskbar, and you disable the control delete. Don't leave a whole lot of options for folks, do we? Now, a good Trojan, even though some of these were designed initially for entertainment purposes, believe it or not, Ha 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 ha. A good Trojan is one that you don't suspect is installed. So you don't necessarily see these things taking place. You might see the system rebooting because maybe I need it to reboot because of a configuration change that I made. Some additional symptoms would also include things like your browser goes somewhere other than what you've typed. For example, you type in Microsoft.com and you go to Google. Actually, you wouldn't go to Google. You'd probably end up going to an inappropriate website. And again, the attacker just made money off of you because he gets paid for everybody who gets directed to that, that site. Yes, there's even more symptoms. The DVD drive, excuse me, the coffee cup holder. I think that's like one of the oldest tech jokes out there, right? The lady who calls up and says that her coffee cup holder is not working correctly. But it ejects randomly, just out of the blue, click, or you hear it spin up. You might also see that documents start printing. And they're not documents that you sent to the printer. Or how about even... The mouse keys get reversed. About that time, I'm going stupid left-handed people. Oh, wait a minute. I'm left-handed. Stupid right-handed people. But wait, there's more. Now, other symptoms could also include a lot of hard drive activity. Look at your system when nobody's using it. Now, sometimes we might see hard drive activity because the system is going through and doing some defrag or some system maintenance or maybe a backup. But again, as I mentioned before, knowing it's half the battle. If there's a lot of activity going on, either at the hard drive or at the network level, and you're just sitting there reading a Word document, I might be a little suspicious. Most of the maintenance tasks that the operating systems will perform will wait until the system is not being used. Another symptom could be also that your ISP calls you and says, uh, listen, you've got a lot of traffic coming from your router. This is actually uh, something I had to deal with when I had my own ISP service. I had people get infected all the time, and I would see a ton of traffic coming out of their antenna that would start flooding our network, and I had to shut off their antennas. I always thought it was interesting that when I tried to contact them, I could never get a hold of them. But as soon as I disconnected their internet, Within like two minutes, people would call me. And of course, the mother of all symptoms is when you get your credit card bill and there's some really weird and expensive purchases. 
and all the products were shipped to Dale Meredith. So in this module, we went through and took a look at what was a Trojan. Remember, a Trojan is simply a piece of malicious software that's hidden inside of a legitimate piece of software. We also talked about the life cycle of a Trojan, how it's created. Oh, and trust me, I'm going to show you how to create a Trojan. We also talked about what were the goals for Trojan writers. Typically, it's monetary based. They're trying to make money either by stealing information, extortion, or just making money off of you going to websites that they're getting paid for you to visit. We then went through and took a look at how do the Trojans hide. Remember our two channels, overt and covert. One of them is the legitimate program. The other one is the Trojan itself. And of course, the plethora of ports that are available or that are utilized by Trojans. And most of the Trojans, you can actually, when you go to create them, you can customize the port to whatever port you want. And then we went and talked about if you really have a clue, uh, if you have a Trojan, that is. Those symptoms you should be talking to with your employees so that when we, they see things like that, that they report it immediately to the IT staff. And then the IT staff needs to know how to react to those types of reports. Now, if you start to see some of those symptoms, personally, I take the system offline. I don't try to fix it. I'm going to format that bad boy. I don't trust any system that has malware on it. Okay, Dale, that's really cool. Where's the beef? When do we get to start playing? Well, in our next module, we're going to go through and talk about how Trojan infections take place and we're going to create our own Trojan server and our own payload. So how does one actually infect a target? Well, we're going to go through a couple of steps to understand how this is done. The first step that we're going to do to create our little monsters is we're going to need some type of a toolkit to create them for us. Now, obviously, we've talked about other products throughout this whole series, and we've already shown you something called Kali, and Kali has a whole lot already built into it. There's actually a Trojan horse construction kit out there, but you could also just use some basic technologies that are built into the OS. For example, I could go through and just quickly create a script or a batch program that would do some damage, in this case here, go through and delete a lot of important system files, and then use it along with my legitimate program. However you want to do it, that's fine. The concept at this step, though, is that you're creating the damage that you want to cause. Step two, you're going to drop it one time for me, brother. Okay, don't give up the day job, right? Now, we're going to actually create what we refer to as a dropper. So what we mean by creating a dropper is that we basically take our monster that we've created and we tell it how to install itself utilizing the desired or the legitimate program. And of course, once we've done that, we end up ready to take our monster and turn it into a cute little teddy bear. Go ahead, double click on him. He won't hurt you. And how we combine the two together is doing something called wrapping. Oh yeah, you know it's coming. Oh, you thought I was gonna break out the mic and go all DJ on you. Well, it could be a candy wrapper. See, that joke works, right? Okay, I'll give it to you. Deal's in the house. Now, what wrapping is, is it basically is software that we use to combine the two programs together. Now, there's a couple of programs out there that you can utilize. There's Petiti, there's um, Graffiti, Elite Wrap, and I'm sure some of you guys might have your favorites. But the concept behind the wrapper is to try to tell a story through lyrical rhyme. <laughs> no, no, its concept is, again, is to be able to take those files and combine them. But we can also combine multiple monsters together so that when somebody installs I don't know, the latest antivirus that they've gotten off a BitTorrent or the latest version of an office suite that they downloaded from a pirated site, they're going to get multiple Trojans installed. Now, by actually going through and using some of these wrappers, they can do a compression of the binary. And this makes it possible for the Trojan to get in without being detected by most antivirus software. And this is because most antivirus software out there is not able to detect the signatures of a file. Yeah, but DL... You're seeing that somebody has to actually execute it. I'll just tell my people not to execute programs. Yeah, okay, that's going to work out, huh? And the biggest reason why this doesn't work out is because many times the infection takes place via a social engineered attack. Let's say I sent you a file, and that file may contain adult materials. Or it could include a cool program like a new screensaver 
Yeah, don't send me a screensaver with Batman images because I actually might install it. More than likely, though, we see a lot of these Trojans being infected via email attachments because of actual files being attached or links to files. I always tell people that when you get an email, we never click on the links because the link may look like you're going to some type of cloud storage company like Dropbox or OneDrive, but the code behind that link could actually be taking you to a different location. And many times we're being socially engineered, especially our end users. They get socially engineered all the time because of pop-ups. And usually it's done in such a way that it's designed to scare the end user or again to affect the greed factor. And what's kind of interesting, if you've ever seen these pop-ups, be careful because whether you hit yes or no or click anywhere, on the pop-up window, you could actually inject the Trojan. In fact, they're really tricky ones. The pop-up ads will look like a window, which will show a close, minimize, and maximize button in the standard upper right-hand corner, or you Apple folks would be, what, in the left corner? But I can make a web page look like that interface, but those aren't real buttons. And if you click on it, okay, I'll close the window down, but I'm going to go ahead and inject. Now, some of the more popular ones, at least in the past, some of you may have seen this one before, especially on a relative's machine, the famous antivirus 2010. A user would go to a website, a malicious website, or they would just get a piece of malware that would activate this interface. They actually created this application so it looked like some type of system application. And it looks like it's trying to protect us, right? Oh no, I, I've been infected, so I better scan now or update my protection now. And many times these, in this particular product's case, it would actually give you false positives back, pretending like it was actually helping you out, when in reality, they were just installing more Trojans and getting more information off your system. The big one in 2015 was a product called CryptoBlocker, which whoever came up with that one, those guys need to be shot, uh, because it would go through and encrypt your drives and your data, including any mapped drive. And we refer to this as extortionware because you had to pay them money to get the decryption key. And of course, the odds were they actually would drain your account. Or we might actually use, remember the fear technique? Well, oh, my computer's been locked. There's something wrong with my OS. I don't want to get in trouble. If, if I want to lock it, I better pay $200 and I have 72 hours to take care of this or else I'm going to be in trouble. And look at the fear factor they're using here. It says my IP address was used to visit websites containing pornography, child pornography, zoophilia, and child abuse. And my, my computer has those files on it. And apparently I've been sending out spam messages to terrorists. So again, this was a, a very famous one for scaring people into paying for something when they actually weren't guilty of anything. And just recently, emails were going out saying, hey, you can upgrade for free. Just click here. Again, this email looks like it's from Microsoft. It's got their logo on it. Down at the bottom, I actually see their address. I'm supposed to follow the attached installer and get started. Yeah, get started giving up your data. Now, let me show you just exactly how easy it is to create a Trojan. Before we talk about how we deploy them. We have to actually create them. So let's do this. I'm going to come in here and, whoops, wrong button. I'm going to come into my host machine. I'm going to come into my Hyper-V services or my Hyper-V manager. You'll notice here that I've got uh, my Windows 8.1 machine up and running. I've got my Kali box. I also got a server 08R2 in case I want to play around with that one. So I'm just going to bring up my Kali box here. And we'll go ahead and make this biggie size so we don't get distracted too much here. So in Kali, we've got under our applications and under Kali Linux, we have several tools in here. And some of the tools we can access from the menu here, but you'll probably have noticed if you've been watching the series, every time we click on one of these tools, it just opens up a terminal session for us. So I'm just going to do that. We can just open up a terminal session. But in case you're wondering, we can come back in here just to show you where we were going to end up going is going to Kali Linux. And then under our exploitation tools, under our social engineering kit, we have our set toolkit. And set toolkit is what I want to show you here. And it would have just opened up this interface for me. Now what I want to do is go ahead and execute this one just by typing in set toolkit. And there's only one T. Don't let that throw you. And do I accept the services? Yes, I accept the services. Whoops. Try that again. There we go. And it's got this nice little menu system for us. Wow, all kinds of fun things that we can create. 
Let's go in here and I'm going to create a social engineering attack. So I'm going to do a one. And then I'm going to specify, let's do PowerShell. That's kind of new and improved, right? One of the new technologies out there. So I'm going to select nine. And then I'm going to go through and we're going to do an alphanumeric shell code injector. So I'm just going to select one. You'll notice here that I could do other things like dump the SAM database, bind a shell, or do a reverse shell. But I'm just going to do the alphanumeric shell code injector, and you'll see why. I'm going to type in the IP address of the payload listener, which is the box that's listening for this particular attack vector. In this case, it's my Kali box. And just as a reminder, here are those IP addresses that we're using. So again, Kali is going to be the .50 address. So I'm going to type in here that the listener is 192.168.0.50. It then says, what's the port that we're going to use for reversing? And we'll leave it at 443 because, hey, we all know what 443 is used for. And of course, it says, do you want to go ahead and start the listener now? Let's go ahead and hit yes. But also notice here where it says, if you want the PowerShell commands and attack, they're exported to root.set backslash reports PowerShell. So I'm going to go ahead and start my listener. And while that's running, let's go ahead and go to that location of where the attack is located. So we'll come in here into our accessories, come down here down to files. And it's starting up the Metasploit framework in the background. And let's go up here and select our view, and let's show our hidden files. And there's our .set directory, and it was inside of reports, inside of PowerShell, and here it is right here. It's called PowerShell injection.txt. Let's go ahead and copy that. Let's send it to our desktop. We'll come here to our desktop now. I'm going to right-click on it, and let's rename it. I'm just going to change the extension to a batch file. Now let's take this. We're going to copy it. And let's see if we can put it on our system. Now, a couple things we'll need to do here, though. Move this off to the side. On our Windows 8.1 box, and again, because I'm just doing kind of a basic one here, uh, Defender would actually end up picking this up. So we're going to throw this at the Windows 8.1 machine but we need to make some changes here. So those changes are going to include Windows Defender comes pre-installed with all the latest and greatest by Microsoft. And because I'm not being real careful here, I'm just creating a Trojan just so you can see what can take place. I'm going to transmit the Trojan. I'm not going to wrap it. We're going to come in here and I'm going to just turn off. Whoops, wrong button here. Again, let's go biggie size. And let's come down here. And let's take Defender. And I'm just going to go ahead and disable it for now. And we're also going to create a directory here on the box that we can dump it to. We'll put it on the C drive. And we'll create a folder called Trojan. And we're going to come in here and share this with everyone. We'll just pretend like this is a location that we found somewhere that permissions aren't set up correctly. And we're going to go ahead and exclude that also, that location from Defender. And we'll save that. Okay, now let's go back to our Kali box and let's drill into our Windows 8 machine. It's asking me for the username, and we'll just use our Bruce Wayne account here, and his password was Batman. And there's my Trojan directory, so let's come in here. Whoops, one more time, apparently. And we'll paste this bad boy in here. And let's go ahead and switch back to the Windows machine. You'll notice over here real fast, though, before we switch, you'll notice that it's started the listener, or we refer to as the handler. So let's see what happens here. We're going to be switching back and forth between these two machines relatively quickly here. So I'm going to come up here, and we're going to pretend like I've got a file that is enticing me to double-click on it. So I'm just going to double-click on it. It popped up for a second and shut right back down. And just so you can see here, I'm going to shut down even that command prompt. And if we look at what's currently running in the task manager, I don't see a whole lot running, do I? But you'll notice that there is a command process running. 
but it looks just like a standard command prompt. Let's go ahead and go back to our Kali box. You'll notice here that it says that I have a meter repeater session opened up with that particular box, 20. Now I'm just going to hit the enter key here, which gives me a prompt back. And I can simply say I'd like to please, let's go into a session here. So we'll see sessions. We'll do a dash I for interactive. And the session number was, if you'll notice right up here, it says it's session one. So I can just type in one. And you'll notice that it's starting to interact with one. And from here, I should be able to just say, oh, hey, what's the, uh, tell me the sysinfo of that box, please. Oh, it's a Windows 8.1 machine. Isn't that nice? What's the computer name? It's Windows 8.1. It's a 64-bit platform. I can even type in help and check out the help. Notice I can do a hash dump. I could try to get the system by elevating my privileges if I wanted to. Let's scroll up here a bit more. You're going to see some other options here that we can use. I can turn on webcams. I can play around with the user interface. Oh, in fact, let's do this. Let's see. I'm going to do a key scan, and I'm going to do an underscore start. And now let's switch back over to that Windows. This is a key logger, folks. Let's switch over to my Windows 8 box. And we're going to just close this down. And let's see, I need to do some online banking. So let's uh, open up uh, Internet Explorer. Now, this isn't going to really work because this box doesn't have Internet access. But we're just going to type in here www.mybankinfo.com. And we'll pretend like that that opened up. And then maybe I type in my, actually, let's do this. I'll type in Notepad. And we'll pretend like I get prompted for a username, which was Bruce Wayne, and my password, which is no one knows who I am. Let's go back here to our Kali box. And one of the other options you have with key scan is I can do a key scan dump. Oh, look. Went to my bank info. Oh, and how nice. They gave me a nice little link so I can just go right there. I opened up Notepad. You notice it said I hit the left Windows key. And you can even see the where I made mistakes. It's got backspaces. But, you know, I got no one. I did backspace. Knows who I am. Other options that you have. I can drop into a system command shell if I want. Just by typing in shell. I can restart the machine. I can get to the user SID. So let's scroll down here and try that. Ah, there's the SID that's being used right now. Let's open up a shell. Oh, I'm in the Trojan directory on that machine. Let's back up. Let's make a directory called Superdale. Let's do a directory. Let's switch back over, folks, to the Windows 8.1 machine. Come down here. Let's open up File Explorer. There's the Superdale directory. Are you guys getting it? Have I mentioned anything about pirated software to you guys yet? Man, I am begging you, please, please, don't jeopardize your networks. Don't jeopardize your own personal security just to save a couple bucks on a piece of software because somebody out there is going to end up pwning you. So how does the malware or Trojans, in this case here, get into our systems? That's the easy part, folks. It'll do it several different ways. I can actually try to implement it via physical access. Maybe I've got a, my Trojan built into a thumb drive that I've dropped, and somebody's picked it up, and all they do is plug it in, and I have an auto start in there that injects. Or somebody walks away from their system without three fingers saluting. Another way in is via email. We've talked about that. And you may be thinking, well, I'm not going to open up an email from somebody I don't know. Okay, go back and think about what we've talked about this whole time or throughout the course. I could very easily spoof. Let's say that Bruce Wayne sends Clark Kent emails all day long. Well, if I've done my due diligence, I could simply create an email and make it look like it came from Bruce Wayne, and I could trick Clark into double-clicking on this file. We see this happen all the time. Again, I don't know, at least once, twice a month, if not a week, I get emails from family members that say, thought you'd be interested in this, and there's a link, and that's all there is in the email. Or a user might be tricked into thinking that they're going to get, I don't know, free internet access or a free movie or 
again, adult material is very, very popular today. And so thinking they're going to get free porn, they might actually run it. Even if the antivirus kicks up and says this file may not be trusted, you'd be surprised how many, or I should say the percentage of people that would hit continue. Another way in to our system is via a fake application. So you're out there looking for an application, I don't know, that maybe helps you organize your garage. All you have to do is, you know, put in your dimensions of your garage or carport area, and it's supposed to go through and help you organize. At least that's the promise. Well, the victim goes through and downloads the program, and when they double click on it to install it, they mark it as being trusted because they want the program so badly. In fact, there's a uh, interesting one I've seen out there many, many times. It deals mostly with MP3s where kids go out and they say, hey, I'm looking for, I don't know, the latest song by whoever's popular at the time. And they do a standard Google search and it shows that this site has that particular file. They really don't. It's just that the attackers are extremely creative where they've gone through and they've taken those popular terms and said, yeah, our site has that. And you go to download the file and it's called, I don't know, again, I'm a collective soul fan and they're releasing a new album actually this month. And so the promise of me getting this song, I download the file that's called, I don't know, the name of their song dot MP3. And when I double click on the MP3, it actually is just the Trojan that executes. And I don't see anything happen. I don't get the song or maybe the song is there. Or my favorite was where you get the programs that look like they're supposed to, they're, they, they call themselves an anti-Trojan software program and they in fact are a Trojan. So make sure that we do our research on the programs that we're installing. Another mechanism in is by using torrent. Yeah, you're you watching this video on a torrent, huh? Huh? You think you got it for free? Sucka. Again, folks, nothing is free out there. More than likely, someone's using your greed to pwn you. Another mechanism in for propagation is our freeware. Okay, there's some really cool freeware products out there. Let's take a popular one, VNC. VNC is great, but you better make sure you download it from the right place because there's hundreds of sites out there that say, oh, this is the website for VNC. This is where you download it. Guess again. Another mechanism, shrink wrapped. Shrink wrapped software could actually have Trojans in them. More than likely, this is by a disgruntled employee who's thinking, man, I could totally pwn thousands of people because everybody wants a copy of this program. Now, I guarantee you large software companies have QA mechanisms in place that stop that from happening. But that's not to say that all software vendors take the same precautions. Another way that we can propagate in is through, obviously, viruses. Many times viruses will actually execute and install additional Trojans for us. And in fact, there are times that Trojans will help to install viruses. And at this point, usually some of you might be thinking, I need to go back and format my hard drive and start over. <laughs> And again, I'm using my air quotes here. I have a friend who in his naive days probably got pwned many times looking back on it. And the other warning I'll give you too, go do yourself a favor. Go Google Trojans PDF documents or just PDF. PDFs are like horrendous right now because everybody puts up PDFs. You want a white paper? Yeah, open up that PDF and watch exploits from some of the PDF readers kick in and somebody end up getting into your system. So the other thing you need to understand about Trojans and the creators is that they can actually create the Trojans to evade antivirus. Now, again, what I'm saying here, just make sure you understand, I'm not telling you that antivirus is your solution or your countermeasure. This is ways to avoid being picked up by antivirus. And there are several different ways that we can do this. One of them is just simply changing the checksum of the file itself, because most antivirus programs will look at the checksum of known viruses and Trojans. Another way that you can avoid is to write your own Trojan. That would technically make your Trojan a zero day attack mechanism. Now you may be thinking, Dale, how do you write your own Trojan? Ah, oh, young Padawan, let me show you. So here I am back at my Kali box. Um, in order to create my own, to avoid antivirus, there's a couple tools that we can use. Now, this first command that I'm going to use, I need to preference this and saying I don't have real time to in the course to tell you all the different variables and switches. But if you know how to use the help system inside of Linux, you should very easily be able to find out what's going on. But I just want to show you here that there is inside of the Kali environment, it's actually part of 
the Metasploit framework, we have something that's called MS Venom, but it's spelt a little funny. It's F-V-E-N-O-M. And I could do a dash P, which basically says it's a switch for payloads. And I'd specify the payload I'd like to use. In this case, I'm going to use the payload that's inside of Windows, inside of uh, Meter Preter, and it's going to be a reverse TCP. I then use a dash E, which is the encoder that I would like to use. And in this particular case, the encoder I'm going to use is x86, Shakita, gotta spell it right, uh, underscore GA underscore NAI, -N -A -I. then I type in the listening host IP, so it's going to be equal to my 192.168.0.50, which is, again, my box that I would be listening for responses to come back on. And I'd also need to do a, a port. Again, we could do this as the port from hell. And then the format would be an executable. And then I'd specify the output file, which could be the bat signal. .exe. And there's actually a, a variable or switches that you could use to say, I'd like to go and grab my uh, uh, the calculator or calc.exe and inject my bat signal inside of it to create a new exe that I could then send to you and say, hey, this is an update to the calculator program. Please make sure that you copy this over to your system32 directory. And then when you run the calculator program, my listening server would actually pick up the fact that somebody is reporting in or phoning home. Now, a lot of the antivirus products out there will pick up on this type of encoder. And here comes that love-hate relationship that I have with Google, but there's actually a Google project out there that's called the Pre-Scrambler, which allows you to scramble executable files. And I'll just leave it at that so that the antivirus products can't pick up on it. Some other ways that we can make sure that our Trojans don't get picked up by antivirus is to use a hex editor to make modifications that will help to hide it from your antivirus software. Also, I could break the Trojan into multiple files because most antivirus programs are looking for specific files that represent the Trojan. By breaking it up, it would never be detected. Also, I could modify the syntax. Again, a lot of the antivirus programs are looking for specific syntaxes within the Trojans themselves. And of course, one of the best things to do, this kind of goes back to writing your own Trojan, but don't ever use Trojans that have already been identified by antivirus products. So that does require you to do a little bit of research. See, and here you thought there wouldn't be any homework. So here we are at the end of this particular module where we went through and took a look at how to get my Trojan to infect a target. Again, our weakest link are our end users and being socially engineered. And again, that social engineer mechanism could be based out of fear, or it could be based out of greed, or even trying to be helpful. We then talked about different ways for the Trojans to enter into our environment, as well as we talked about different deployment mechanisms that we could utilize. Again, remember, we can propagate or deploy via physical access. We also had, again, freeware, shrink-wrapped, faked applications, emails, and torrents. And then, of course, we also went through and took a look at how do we get our Trojans to be able to bypass our antivirus solutions that are in play, or how are attackers doing this? And your best practices, or I should say your biggest defense here, is educating your users, not keeping things top secret as far as what do we do when certain files come across the environment, or where do we get our files? In particular, making sure they don't bring files from home because we don't allow a particular application or we won't install a particular application on their machine and they want to run it regardless. And so they go off and download it from somewhere. Again, education is your primary defense mechanism in this battle. So remember, I told you, you were going to take the red pill. Ooh, I could continue the quote. Let's see. The pill you took is part of a trace program. It's designed to disrupt your input-output carry signal so that we can pinpoint your location. Hmm, kind of relevant now, huh? Stacks of Wax and Mounds of Sound coming to you live from Plural Site, your online training company. I'm Superdale, and we're counting down the top 10 Trojans. Starting off with number 10, it squeaked its way in from number 12. Folks, I think this one's heading to the top of the charts like a bullet. It's your favorite and mine, Notification Trojans. 
<laughs> okay. So when it comes to, no I know, don't stop my day job, right? When it comes to notification trojans, they actually are several different types, kind of like a subcategory. The whole purpose of a notification trojan is that it basically, ooh, another movie reference here, wants to phone home. Or it sends the IP address of the target that it's infected back to the attacker. And we can do that at different times or in different aspects depending on the type of notification trojan you have installed or you've gotten installed. One of them is referred to as an IRC trojan. Now this just simply uses the IRC channels out there to communicate with the attacker. There's also a PHP notification trojan which sends its data by, yeah, you got it, sending it via a PHP server, or I should say connecting to the PHP server that the attacker owns or is pwned. There's also a net send notification trojan. And this is just basically sending information or commands to the targeted machine via the net send command. We also have ICQ notifications, which again just notifies the attacker when we were, these are just different mechanisms or communication channels to talk with the attacker from the target that, hey, I got installed. Remember, our purpose of a Trojan is mass distribution. So I'm just sitting here waiting via one of these channels for my payload to, to report back to me. So I can use the ICQ channels or even just doing it simply through email. Can't get much easier than that, huh? Now the other type of Trojan that we have available to us is coming in at number nine, the botnet Trojan. Yeah, you're gonna have to deal with this through this whole module. <laughs> but a botnet Trojan is basically a Trojan that helps me to combine multiple pwn systems together. So I can issue one command and control all the machines that have been affected with this Trojan simultaneously. Now one of the biggest targets for these types of Trojans would be educational, government, and military. Now, another phrase that you might hear when we talk about botnets is the phrase a zombie computer, which is simply just a computer that's been infected with these types of Trojans. And the attacker can bring these machines online at their whim to use them for things like, oh, sending spam or launching a DOS attack against another company. Now, again, the attacker remotely with one command can implement through his botnet a denial of service attack. He could also use it for sending out mass mailings via spam or SMTP and he could also use it for what we refer to as click fraud. This is where we typically see things like the FBI knows that you are looking at child pornography and it's designed to scare you or possibly that we've detected you using pirated software and you need to pay us some money. As I mentioned this before I call this extortionware as well. We could also use it for stealing product keys, login IDs, credit card numbers, all kinds of information. Now the reason why the education, government, and military systems are very popular for these types of Trojans is because think about how many computers are in an education environment, especially like in a lab, a computer lab environment. Who's maintaining those? Is the person maintaining those aware that, I don't know, maybe the students are downloading software that's infected with these types of Trojans. Coming in at number eight, we've got the proxy server Trojan. Now, a proxy server Trojan, it's going to get loaded on our target. It then starts proxying out for us, meaning the attacker can use the victim's machine or pass through it. We turn the victim's machine into a proxy server to make it so that we could then go after another target and get all the blame put on the first victim. So it'd be similar to creating our proxy chain. And believe it or not, there are actually thousands and thousands of machines out on the internet currently that are infected with proxy servers running as a hidden service on a machine without the end user knowing it or the enterprise admin knowing it. Coming in at number seven, and working its way to the top, we have FTP server trojans. I bet you can figure out what this one's going to do. If I can infect you with this type of trojan, I'm going to install an FTP server on your machine. If you followed any of my previous courses, you know my story about my customer when I had my own wireless ISP service who had this infection. Once it's been infected, the trojan will then send connection information back to the attacker, almost like a notification. But we're just simply going to use port 21 for that machine. And then, of course, obviously, at that point, the attacker will be given full access 
via the FTP protocol. It typically will also install additional malware to make it a little bit easier for the attacker to get in. Again, the type of information that the attacker can pull off of a target machine would include things like credit card information, confidential information. I'm going to be looking for documents that you know are called password.docx or email addresses. But as far as the connection is concerned, you'll just see an FTP service running. Dear Superdale, until recently, I've been using the same computer for three years. I love it, and I think it loves me deeply, and it would do anything for me. One day, I decided to click on a link in an email, and since then, my computer seems to be wanting to handle other requests instead of paying attention to me. Superdale, I need to know if my computer still loves me, and will she give me some extra processing power? Superdale, will you please play Weird Al Yankovic's It's All About the Pentiums? Signed, Desperate in Silicon Valley. Sure, Silicon Valley. Here's your long-distance dedication Trojan. It's called the VNC Trojan. So VNC Trojan, there's actually two aspects to it. The first one is, is that we just simply infect your machine with a VNC Trojan, which fires up what we refer to as a VNC server daemon. After the attacker is notified that the VNC server is up and running, he just simply hooks into it with a VNC viewer with the password of secret. Yeah, that's, that's a real tough one, huh? Now, the big kicker to this one is that VNC is extremely popular. A lot of IT guys use it for remote administration. And because it's so popular, it is actually classified as a utility, and therefore, your antivirus probably won't pick it up as being any type of an infection. Now, the other aspect to a VNC Trojan is this. This is an easier way to do it. First of all, a lot of end users find out that IT guys are making their life easy by using this particular product. So they go on the internet and do a search for VNC software. And if you've ever done that before, you know you'll get, oh yes, another time, a plethora of Google results or Bing results or whatever you're using. Not all of them are the legitimate VNC product. It's because it's being modified by folks. There's real VNC, there's tight VNC, there's chicken of the VNC. But a end user may not understand what he's doing, so I as an attacker could go through and create my own VNC, which basically has a built-in back door, and they just installed it for me, more than likely with administrative privileges. Coming in at number five, we have the HTTP, HTTPS Trojans. Now, I love technology. I love where we've come from. Back in the old days, we used to use some pretty archaic technologies in order to gain access to resources, in particular email. Back in the day we had something, at least in the Microsoft world, that was called Outlook Web Access, which used simply HTTP and HTTPS to allow me to gain access to my email. And they've taken that technology, at least Microsoft has, and other companies have too. And they've made it so that you can actually create a tunnel. Now, the issue that we have here is that most of these tunnels are created on either port 80 or 443. Using those ports to create the tunnel, the security administrator or security specialist will simply see standard HTTP traffic or web browsing traffic. They have no idea that it's a tunnel. Now, once we get infected or we infect the target, the Trojan is executed on that target and spawns what we refer to as a child. That child program just simply appears to be a target to the firewall, which then allows it to access the Internet because it's just going across port 80 and 443. So all the traffic technically gets converted to a, they refer to it as like a base 64 type structure. And it's given a value in a CGI string. So this way here, the attacker's commands are actually hidden from the security professional and in most cases, security appliances. And with that, an attacker can use commands, and these would be HTTP, HTTPS base commands like a get. So the get of the internal target is just a command prompt of the shell. And the answer is an encoded is command from the attacker. Now, as far as the administrator is concerned, when they open up the connections to the attacker server and tries to connect to it to himself, try, trying to trace this thing down, the attacker just sees a broken web server because there's actually no token or password in the encoded CGI GET request. Now, the kicker on this one is that the programs are relatively small. In fact, there are some out there that are under 300 lines per file. 
And these type of Trojans are infecting not just PCs as, as of late, but also any device that has access to the Internet or uses a web browser. Coming in at number four, we've got the Command Shell Trojans. Now, when it comes to Command Shell Trojans, these are basically a Trojan that installs a server on the target machine, which then in turn opens up a port for the attacker to connect to. And once the attacker hits that client, he's actually given remote control of a command shell, hence the name command shell, on that target's machine. One of the most popular command shell Trojans is called Netcat. Now with Netcat, an attacker can actually open up a full Telnet session into a shell on the target machine. He can actually create inbound and outbound connections using either TCP or UDP. And he can actually provide full DNS forwarding and reverse checking so he's able to transverse your environment. And so that we don't raise any suspicions, we can implement slow-mo. In slow-mo, we shut the Yeah, you were checking your speakers, weren't you? In slow-mo, we actually slow down the speed in which we send information back and forth. That way there, it makes it harder for the security specialist to figure out what's going on. Very similar to using paranoid mode with Nmap. If you go back and look at our video with scanning, we talked about using Nmap and putting it in paranoid mode so that it wasn't being really noisy or loud on the network. Next up, we've got document trojans. When it comes to document trojans, what we're doing is we're just simply embedding our trojan inside of the document. And we're going to then send that document via email out to people. Hey, here's the new IRS form that the government needs you to fill out or else you're going to be penalized. See, that sounded all official, didn't it? And believe it or not, a high percentage of people would click on that email attachment. And of course, nothing is better than to get people to do my work for me. So if it's a really cool document, hopefully they'll forward those documents on for me, especially if it's a funny document or maybe a Flash movie. Check out this Flash movie. It's so funny. In fact, some of the biggest document Trojans out there right now exist in PDF documents. Folks, do me a favor. Do not open up PDF documents from people that you don't know or from emails that you're not expecting. I know it's like this big list of things that we have to remember not to do, which does interfere with our day-to-day -day productivity. It's, it's rough, guys. I get it. And probably one of the, the bigger Trojans out there is an email-based Trojan. With email-based Trojans, these bad boys fire off as soon as you open up an email. And then it sends the commands via email back and forth to the Trojan. Those commands can include things such as executing applications, searching for files or opening files, as well as showing me files on a system. Now coming in at number one, the top of the list is my favorite, rats. Now a rat, and he's all ghetto, ain't he? He's about to tag my screen. A rat is short for a remote access Trojan. And there are several of them out there. Here's where we could go off for hours and hours and hours. The more famous ones, these are relatively old, I know, but we have Back Orphus back in the day as well as Netbus. Now, most of the rats today are actually custom-made. In fact, most recently, the latest rats allow the attacker to turn on the webcam of the victim. Hmm. Think about that one for a minute. By the way, I have a little cover that I put over my webcam just as a precautionary mechanism. But there are actually forms out there where hackers are selling access to the victim's bedrooms. Think about where your laptops are, your tablets. In fact, one user was advertising that he had a hundred slaves for sale and he was selling them for five dollars per female and a dollar per male. Hey, that's sexist, didn't it? So with a rat, what we're doing is we're just simply installing a small application on the target machine, which is actually referred to as the server side. And then the attacker just hits that server from the outside and bam, he's got remote access where he can affect administrative controls, he can raise privileges, he can implement a keylogger. And there are several pre-configured rats out there. There's Dark Comet, there's Apocalypse, but I'm going to go through here and show you guys a little bit about Beast. Okay, so here comes the beast. 
Release the Kraken! Yeah, this thing's pretty scary, guys. When I go through this demo, I'm going to show you a couple of safety precautions. Um, I want to make sure that you, first of all, do not run this on any of your actual machines. Can't guarantee that the Trojan Maker itself doesn't, in fact, have its own Trojan built in it. And that should be said of any Trojan creation product out there. Most of the time, you'll go to download these products, and most of your antivirus product will recognize them as being a Trojan. And you might see some people say, I would, this always cracks me up, uh, where they're like, my antivirus says that this is a Trojan or it has a Trojan in it. And the author who uploaded the file will be, oh no, just disable your antivirus. It's saying that because it creates Trojans, which that may be the case, but yeah, just trust me, it'll work. Just disable your antivirus. So what I've done is I've actually gone through and set this up for you or, or helped you out a bit. Let's fire up our virtual machines here. So I've got my Windows XP machine and in the courseware files, you'll see one that's called beast version 2.07.zip.crap. And the reason I called it crap is so that most antivirus programs won't try to pick it up. So you can download this from the source files in the courseware, but put it in your virtual machines. Once you've done that, especially you want to do this on your XP machine, I'm going to go through and rename it to just a standard zip file. Now this particular version of XP, I have no antivirus on it. I have not running Defender or anything like that. So I'm not going to see any errors pop up, but it's a simple zip file. And I can go ahead and extract this. We'll go ahead and extract it to the desktop. We'll hit finish and you'll come in here and there's just two little files in here. One is undetectable, which is you can send them some money and they'll send you an undetectable private version of Beast. Uh, or you can also look at the readme file, which shows you some of the things that they've added over the years. And of course, here's the nifty little icon for the product itself. Let's go ahead and fire this bad boy up. I'll go ahead and select I'd like to run it. And I know it doesn't look menacing, but Trust me, it's got a lot more to it than you think. So this is the beast interface where I would start to see IP addresses of my targets as they were infected by my Trojan based software. Now, the first thing I'd want to do is I'd want to come in here and actually build up my beast server. And in it, we can go through and set up our ports. If we want to do a reverse connection or direct connection, what do you want to call the service? SVC host. Yeah, nobody would ever see that. And where do you want it to reside in, inside of Windows or inside of the system directory? Do you want to inject it inside of Internet Explorer or inside of Explorer or just inject it inside of your own executable? So you can say, please inject it. And notice it modifies the DLL for us. I can come into the notifications and say, how would I like to be notified? Well, I can be notified by email or ICQ or CGI. I can just simply do an email. I can enable email. I can edit the message. The message is going to just simply tell me the victim's IP address, the port number, then come in here to my startup. And this is where it's specifying where do you want to start up inside of? Where do you want to put the startup of this Trojan? You'll notice that I can place it inside of ActiveX, inside of HK Local Machine, as well as inside of the HK, excuse me, HK Current User, both of them being in the comm service. I come down here to the firewall and antivirus kill where I can go through and say, you know what, just kill it, kill the antivirus or kill it every five seconds. You can also come in here and select configure to find the executable for the antivirus product and add in your own if you'd like. We also have miscellaneous where I can clear out restore points. Yeah, in this evil. I can melt the server on install. Yeah, that's a fun one too. I can enable a key logger. If I configure it, I can say how often to send out the emails of the uh, keys being entered. Go ahead and cancel this. We can also have a fake message pop up and I can go through and give it an icon. And then I can say if they, doesn't matter if they hit the OK button, if they hit OK or cancel, yes or no, yes, no, or cancel. If they do anything, go ahead and execute. And here's the error messages that I could have it apply. And then down here, I can specify the actual icon that I want to be displayed and you obviously I can go off and get an icon for almost any application including hey here's an icon for Outlook Express back in the old days or MIRC or I'm sure I could go find a icon for an antivirus product make it look like it's an antivirus program that's running once you're done setting this all up oh here I can disable the XP firewall I save the server and it's up and going now and then I can just simply go through and push out my Trojan by binding it. Remember we talked about wrappers? 
wiki wiki wah. This is the binder program where I can go through and say, please add in a file. And let's go ahead and just add in, here's my server executable file. We'll open that up. Let's add another file. Let's come in here and just simply add in, come into our C drive, Windows. Whoops. Yeah, Windows. We've got a bunch of uh, updates in here listed, huh? Uh, we're just going to grab explore.exe and we're going to bind those files together and we're just going to simply call it, we'll put it on the desktop. We're going to call it updated Windows file. Oh, I should have chosen a different icon, but it's okay. You can see that it got created for us. You can see here's the executable file. I then just need to deploy that out to my machines. And as they email me back their IP addresses, I would just put in their IP address, the port number that I was using, my password. So I'm listening right now. As the IP addresses showed up here, I can come in here and pull up their files, registry. Oh, let's open up their webcam. Take a look at their apps, their processes running, their clipboard, their, hey, let's dump some passwords. We can come in here into Windows. I can hide all their windows. I can power off. I can reboot the machine. I've got some lamer stuff where I could hide the tray, disable the tray, open the CD. <laughs> That's so funny, Dale. I could hide the clock or swap the mouse buttons, or I could make the mouse crazy so when they move the mouse around, it would be all jiggly. We can also come down here to fun stuff. Yeah, this is way fun. Hide the mouse. That's always a good one. Set up some restrictions. Come into the server. I can close the server or I can kill the server if I see that maybe they're getting close to me. I can also pull up some info. Here's where I can launch my key loggers, pull up the system time. And they also have this section here for about the beast itself. And there's plugins that you could get, or at least you could get back in the old days. Again, this is kind of a, an older product, but the concept here is understanding how easy it is to get a Trojan to operate. And again, just simply by double clicking on a file. In fact, let's do this. It's Office 2016. .exe. I could change the icon. All I got to do is get somebody to just double click on it. Maybe that was the installation for Office 2016. And it would go through and do the actual installation, but Beast would actually launch up for us. Okay, Dale, I'm getting scared now. Yeah, I'm glad. Okay, so in this module, we went through and we took a look at couple things. We first went through and looked at the top 10 Trojans, at least according to moi, and that included things like our botnet Trojans, our FTP server Trojans, our notification Trojans, our VNC Trojans. We also had HTTP and HTTPS tunneling Trojans, command shell Trojans, document Trojans, email Trojans, and then finally we ended up with rats. Ah, uh, you dirty rat. Okay, you have to be really old to understand that one. And then we went through and took a look quickly at a neat little Trojan creator. And like I mentioned before, folks, there are hundreds of these things out there. You just need to understand the concept of what's out there and where do we get our files or where our users are getting the files because more than likely, if they've pirated them, I'm almost guaranteeing that you've got a Trojan in your environment. And we looked at Beast and how easy. Wasn't that easy? In fact, do yourself a favor. Here's another homework assignment for you. Go and do a YouTube search for Create a Trojan. And look at how many of the authors are little kids, which was kind of shocking for me. Maybe my job's in jeopardy. So now that we've talked about those, let's jump in, in the next module and talk about viruses and worms. So what's the difference between a virus and a worm? Well, in order to look at these, we need to go through and compare what they are designed to do. And some people may say that you're comparing apples to apples, and they're really close with each other. But when it comes to a virus, what you need to understand is that a virus is just simply, again, we said it's a piece of malware, but it's designed to execute. And when it execute, it likes to associate or attach itself to a file or program. Now, those file and programs could be almost any file or program. But as a virus creator, I probably want to make sure that the virus executes every time the operating system fires up. So many times the virus creator will go through and make sure that it replaces system files so that every time the operating system boots up, we make sure that the machine is infected. Now we can also infect other types of files or programs, like for example, I can make my virus attach itself to Word. But again, that virus would then only become active once the application is actually launched. 
Now, when it comes to a virus, one of the biggest differences between a virus and a worm is this, is that in order to execute, it requires some type of human interaction. And isn't that the case with a real virus? You don't get sick unless you come in contact with somebody that has the virus. Well, how do we get in contact? Typically, viruses are transmitted via downloads. I've given the warning before in other courses, and I'll give it to you guys again because I'm a big proponent of this, and that is do not download programs, no matter how cool you think they may be or how bad you want them, unless it's coming from the manufacturer. This would include movies, music, videos. Hmm. Hope you're watching this from plural site. But we can also get them or transmit them via different types of drives. Today, most of this is done by USB drives. Going back and talking about the classic USB drop, where we drop a USB drive in a parking lot or in a hallway and have someone plug it in, and maybe there's a file in there that says top secret, don't run, dot doc, and when they execute from the USB drive, we infect the machine. Now, back in the old days, this was done with floppy drives. For those of you guys that are too young to remember floppy drives, back in the day, we had these devices that held a whopping 1.4 megabyte of data. You know, my wife still to this day gets confused. She thought that the three and a half inch floppy drive, because it had a outer plastic case, she considered that a hard drive versus the five and a quarter floppy, which, you know, was floppy. But a bigger way of transmitting or a more productive way of transmitting viruses today, especially, is through email or even through social media posting things on social media sites that direct users to websites that have malicious code injected in them. And if you aren't familiar with that, I highly recommend checking out some of Troy Hunt's courses when it comes to malicious websites. But the email could also just include an attachment. So that's our definition of a virus. Now, when it comes to a worm, again, there are some very strong similarities to them. They still will want to attach themselves, but it'll copy itself and replicate all on its own. It doesn't require any humans. We humans too stupid. It'll just execute by itself. So if one machine in your environment gets infected, it'll start working its way throughout your environment, your network environment. And typically it does this through what they refer to as a vulnerability. It starts looking for vulnerabilities within your network. Now, as far as transportation or the transmission of a worm, yes, we still will enter in the environment via the same techniques as a virus. But once we're inside, the worm itself, because it's all automated. Wow, this is starting to sound more and more like Skynet all the time. <laughs> but it uses the just our standard file transport features to hook into multiple machines or all the machines within our network, sometimes even outside of our network. Let me give you a great example. Probably one of the most devastating worms that was out there was a worm that was called SQL Slammer. Now, SQL Slammer, you like this image here. I'll tell you about this one. This was the infection of SQL Slammer. Just look at it for a second and go, wow. I'm going to tell you something in a second that's going to just shock the bejeebas out of you here. But SQL Slammer was actually presented back in 2002 as a proof of concept vulnerability. Microsoft actually, about six months later, released a patch for it. But the problem that we had was that a lot of IT guys didn't apply the patches because this was back in the day when we would get an update from Microsoft and nobody would apply it because they were afraid it was going to crash their system because of some previous issues that Microsoft had. Or, again, lazy IT. Now, SQL Slammer was actually created a denial of service attack and actually slowed down the Internet traffic as a whole. And what it attacked was the Microsoft SQL, both the server and the desktop engine database. Now, this particular worm didn't affect a whole lot of home users just because of the fact that not everybody's running SQL on their home PC or not very many people would use what they refer to as MSDE which was kind of the light version of an SQL server on a desktop environment. Now, go back and look at the picture again here. This was a representation of how many machines were infected. 75,000 machines were infected, you ready? Within 10 minutes. Now, I mentioned that SQL Slammer was a denial of service and that it slowed down the Internet as a whole. Now, the reason for this slowdown was because it caused routers 
to be flooded with traffic from the infected servers. And normally when a router gets a lot of traffic, the router's supposed to go through and delay or even temporarily stop network traffic. But instead, the router's actually crashed. And then what would happen is a neighboring router would notice that these routers had stopped and they would update their routing tables. So the routers started sending notices to other routers that they knew about. And because these routing tables were being updated so fast because of so many nodes being infected, it caused additional routers to fail. Because again, the internet or its bandwidth was being consumed by these routers trying to communicate with each other, trying to update the tables. Now this thing was so bad that some of the stats that I've seen, there was like 300,000 cable modems in Portugal that went out. I think South Korea just basically went black. There was no cell phone or internet service for, it was over 25 million people. And five of the internet's 13 root name servers actually went down. So websites stopped responding, ATM machines went down, airline ticketing systems went down. It was really quite bad for its time and day, folks. And for those of us in the U.S., this thing actually hit at 12.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And by, I think it was like 12.30, like 30 minutes later, the number of slave servers doubled every 8.5 seconds. So again, folks, this was really, really a bad one. I think it's actually when companies started to really take a look at security, or at least protecting themselves with patches. Okay, so now let's take a look at some different types of viruses and worms. Now again, I get to use my favorite word, especially when it comes to dealing with multiple options, and that is you could definitely say that there is a plethora of viruses and worms. In fact, you're going to see them come from different avenues or different aspects. I often think of the phrase, Daddy, make the bad man go away, when I start to see all of these things, because they come at you at different angles and they do different things. So first of all, we have what they refer to as just a standard file virus. Now these viruses execute based off of a file that they've attached themselves to. So there's tons of different types of file viruses that are out there currently. Now typically file viruses are going to target files such as executables or comms. And based on how they attack or attach themselves, can determine how we categorize them. For example, we have what they refer to as prepending file viruses, which write themselves to the beginning of the host file code. We have appending, which I'm sure you can figure that one out. We also have overwriting, which basically overwrites the host code with its own code. And then there's also one that's called inserting, which the virus code itself injects itself inside the gaps within the host file code. And again, most of these types of viruses will target themselves specifically at the operating system files. Tell us more, Dale. Okay, well, just take it easy there. A cluster virus is a virus that doesn't actually change the targeted file or put any information inside the file. Instead, it just goes through and modifies the directory information so that the entry points to the virus code instead of the actual program itself. But Dale, what about the boot sector? I know. There are actually what they refer to as boot sector viruses. So most operating systems get divided into different areas. They're referred to as sectors. And that's actually where we store our applications, or I should say the programs, for the operating system. Now, the most common is the MBR, or the master boot record. And how I envision the MBR is very similar to, back in my day, when I went to the library, if I wanted to find a book, I would go to this big, huge box that had all these drawers, and the drawers inside of them had index cards. Anybody remember the Dewey Decimal System? But I would go over there and I'd say I'd like to find a book on, oh, UFOs. And all the books would be listed on each index card, or one index card represented each book. And you could say, okay, this book here that's called A Structural Analysis of E.T. could be found in section 104.5. And you could actually go to section then 104 and look for the book in the dot five section. Well, that's similar to what the MBR does is it actually tracks everything on the hard drive. And here's the kicker is if I can infect and destroy the boot sector, say goodbye to your data. Now the DOS boot sector or this record, the, the DBR is executed whenever the operating system is turned on or boots up. And again, this could be another place that we could send an attack. 
And based off of this, I could infect your boot sector with the virus codes. So with the boot sector virus, we actually moved the MBR to a different location altogether and replaced it or the original location with our own virus code. After the virus code executed, because it was in the master boot record, it passed on to where we moved the MBR to so that the operating system would continue to launch, but the whole time the OS was actually infected. Now, another famous type of virus that went around, and it's not so dangerous anymore, but I'm sure they're still out there. They're called macro viruses. Now, a macro virus would actually use an application such as Excel. Remember Excel? Anybody ever build a macro in Excel or Word? And I just like saying Word, so I sound all gangsta, you know, Word. But we could infect those type of applications so that when, and in fact, the most common one with Microsoft Word was that we could infect the or replace the normal dot dot, which is the template for all new documents in Microsoft Word. And every time somebody launched a new version of a document, the virus automatically performed a sequence of actions, such as deleting them. Now, typically these viruses were transmitted via emails because people would have their document that they created with the infected template, and they would email that because they were trying to communicate via business and they would email that document because of just normal business practices and the person receiving the email would open up the Word document, boom, another one bites the dust. Uh, just on a side note here, believe it or not, the Windows help system or the help files can also contain macro viruses. Most of the macro viruses that we see today are actually being transmitted via a particular extension for documents that everybody uses worldwide now. And this application seems to be getting patched almost daily. In fact, I just read an article the other day. I guess I should tell you who the company is. It would be Adobe. But just the other day, they patched Flash and within hours, there was a new vulnerability. But most of the macro viruses that we see today are being distributed via PDFs. So, yeah, where'd you get your PDF from? Hey, I, I got one I want to send you. Just drop an email to Dale. Another type of virus is referred to as a polymorphic virus. Ooh, that sounds scary. Well, it is a little scary. In fact, you might see something about this type of virus in your immediate future. Wink, wink, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Those of you guys that don't know, that's my hint of something in your immediate future. I'm trying not to make reference to an exam that may be in your immediate future. You may want to know about polymorphic viruses. These typically will actually modify their code on their own so that they avoid detection. Now, typically this morphine or mutation is executed by what they refer to as a polymorphic engine. They also call it a mutation engine or even a mutating engine. Now, when it deals with these mutating engines, you, you need to contact Dr. Xavier. See, I, I just can't go that long without slapping a joke in, right? This engine is actually used to change the encryption module and the instruction sequence. And so it's always changing, which makes it harder for antivirus products to discover a zero day type virus. Now, if polymorphic doesn't scare you, then maybe you should take a look at metamorphic. With metamorphic viruses, these actually rewrite themselves completely each time that they infect a new file. So talk about Skynet. These bad boys will actually go and reprogram themselves by taking their own code, translating them into a temporary representation, and then back to the normal code again. One of the most popular ones out there was called Simile, which was written in an assembly language, and 90% of its code got rewritten every time it hit a different machine. So there was a bazillion, yeah, look up that number, huh? Bazillion renditions of the Simile virus. There's another one out there that was called Zmist. This particular one used a technique that was called code integration where the code inserted itself into other code, then regenerated the code and rebuilt the executable. Talk about a smart virus. We also have cavity-based viruses. Some folks will actually call them file overriding viruses as well. Now, these type of viruses were actually known as space fillers. And what they would do is they would take a document. Let's say the document was, oh, uh, 1.5 meg in size. Maybe it's a Word document the virus would actually go through and overwrite the host file with consistent null statements. And it would do this without increasing the length of the file. 
So the virus is then able to install itself technically in unoccupied space without destroying any of the original code. These type of viruses are also very difficult to write and therefore we don't see them that often. Now we also have something called encryption viruses and yeah, you can pretty much guess what these bad boys are gonna do, right? So with these, each of the infected files that get hit, the virus is encrypted using a different combination of keys and because they're encrypted, it's not possible for a virus scanner to directly detect the virus via what they refer to as the signature of the virus because it's encrypted. Now there's also associated with these viruses a decrypting module. So even though you might find the decrypting module, the files that have been encrypted, you probably won't get a hold of. Another type of virus is referred to as a camouflage. Whoa, the word was up there just for a second. I don't see anything, that's weird. A camouflage virus uh, is actually kind of an old tricky one. What we do is this is based off of the understanding of how operating systems work. But what would happen is let's say that you had a program that was called word.exe. Well, a camouflage virus would actually go make a copy of that executable, but give it a com extension. And of course the file would be infected with the virus itself. Well, anybody who knows about DOS, we know that, or about Windows, I should say, is that the order that these files execute, if you have, well, here's a trivia question, you ready? If you have three, I'll give you three files. If you have three files, all of them that are called Batman, you have batman.com, batman.exe, batman.bat, or batch file. If you were to go to a DOS prompt and type in Batman, what executes? Well, if you're an old DOS dog like me, you know that a com would execute first, then the executable, and then batch files are executed after that. So by renaming the word.exe or creating a copy of it and calling it word.com, if somebody was to type in word, the com edition with the virus would automatically execute. Oh, I see now, Dale. No, you don't. It's camouflaged. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we also have what they refer to as shell viruses. Can I throw in a turtle joke here? Maybe turtles that know ninja, maybe they're teenage. A shell virus, what it does is the virus code forms a shell around the actual program code, making itself the original program and the host code as a subroutine. We also have what they refer to as a file extension virus. Now these aren't anything big and tricky. In fact, let me show you what they mean by these. This is basically where we're gonna go through and take a file extension and change it so that the user thinks it's something else. So I'm gonna pull up here real fast my hard drive and I just created a directory here called hacking. I'm doing this on my own host machine. Now, if I was to go through and create a file that's called, actually, I'm gonna do something here. I'm gonna change the problem that we have with these file extension viruses is the way that Windows, at least from the Windows perspective, how Windows comes set up ahead of time. Now I've got my windows set up the way that I like for it to run. And most of us IT guys run it the same way as far as viewing files. But let me go in here. Typically we like to see the file extensions. So if I was to come in here and say, I'd like to create a new file here, we'll do a new text file and we're going to call it batman.txt. Well, the default for windows is not to show that extension. So what we mean by a file extension virus is, is this is what if I did this? What if this was actually a VB script and I hide that? Well, the standard end user thinks it's gonna be just a standard text file or better yet, what if I change it to JPEG? Oh, we'll do this, Batman in a swimsuit. <laughs> so most people would think that this was just simply, and I could change the icon if I wanted to as well, but most people would think that this was a JPEG and when they double click on it, it would actually execute the VB script, or this could be you know, even a batch file. So the countermeasure for this bad boy, it's real hard, you ready? Pop, that's what you do. So you always know what the extension is of the file you're about to run. If you're not running the latest and greatest by Microsoft, you can always come to options and select the change folder and search options. This goes all the way back to Windows XP, and you can come down here to view and select to or deselect, I should say, hide extensions for known file types. Well, that makes sense, Dale. I know.
And last but not least, we have what they refer to as tunneling viruses. Sometimes people will refer to these as stealth viruses as well. These viruses hide themselves from antivirus programs by hiding the original size of the file or possibly temporarily placing a copy of itself in some other drive in the system. So these viruses will actually go through and hide the modifications that it makes. It takes control of the system's function that reads and write files and system sectors so that the antivirus can't identify them. Now these are the most common viruses that we see out there. There are many more. There's things out there like intrusive viruses, there's TSR viruses, there's add-on viruses, and every day there's more and more being created. So again, being aware of what's going on is what's going to help you defend yourself against these nasty little monsters. So what's the life cycle of malware? Well, again, when two people really love each other, they... No, I'm just kidding you. This is in the aspect of looking at what happens throughout the whole process of, at least from the perspective of the malware creator, is it's alive. And so just like any good little monster, there is a phase that we go through or a stage that we go through within this life cycle that starts off with the creation of that virus. Now, anyone who has any type of programming knowledge is capable of creating a type of virus or worm. In fact, if you don't have that skill set, you can also use some really cool things out there for our script kitties like a construction kit. The next stage in the life cycle is then the replication of the virus meaning that we need to get it onto a target machine, how do we plan on doing that and making sure that it gets implemented? The next stage is when somebody goes, oh crap, and they've discovered that something's on their machine or something's causing their machine to act a little different or a little funny. You can also refer to this as the detection stage. Once we go through the discovery stage, we then have the resolution stage. And this is typically done by the manufacturers of the antivirus products because they will go through and try to create different types of defenses against the virus. And then of course they deploy those out, which leads us out to the purging stage, which is typically how I feel right after a good dinner. But it's during this stage that we actually eliminate the virus itself. And again, then the whole process starts over because we create one virus, it's not gonna necessarily last the test of time. We're always creating new and improved ones. Now, as far as the virus itself is concerned, once we get to that replication, between replication and discovery, we have two different phases. No, I'm not talking about those nifty space guns that we like to set to stun when I talk about a phase. I'm talking about, first of all, we have the infection phase. Several different things happen during the infection phase. First of all, the virus goes through and replicates and attaches itself to the targeted file or program that we specified when we created it. Now, the viruses themselves need some way of implementing themselves, so we have what they refer to as an event that's needed. And those events can include anything from, for example, let's maybe set it up so that the virus fires off when someone installs an application. If I can infect the startup files, wouldn't that be a good one, huh? Yeah, think about that one. So every time they install the program, the virus just got reinstalled. This is extremely prominent right now in the pirating world because, hey, you downloaded the piece of software, you're going to install it, and I'm going to get you. Other things that we might implement is we might set up a startup setting, which basically would go through and modify certain sections of the registry to make sure that the virus activated every time it started up. And of course, we also have, this is kind of a little old school, but it's still viable, and that is creating what they refer to as TSR, or terminate and stay ready, which is basically where we hide the virus inside of memory, and it just executes or waits for a trigger, but it's waiting inside of RAM. In fact, there are some viruses that you would reboot the machine and it would just get loaded right back into RAM again. Now, the other phase, we do want to set our phasers to kill. Shields, red alert. Now, the attack phase is where we actually see things like corruption taking place. During the attack phase, the virus executes and it does things to corrupt our files, such as deleting them completely, maybe going through and saying, find all JPEGs and whack them, or find all COM files and delete those. Anything it can do to make the system unstable. I might have it go through and alter the file contents. We talked about this with some of the different types of viruses where they hide themselves inside of the file, or better yet, I just change the file content, which could actually result in the system slowing down. 
because the OS doesn't understand how to handle the modified files. We could also go through and do something like executing tasks. Now this is in reference to having tasks performed that aren't related to the application at all. Maybe images start show, whoa, oh crap, oh no. <laughs> Now obviously the unexpected happening is a good indication that maybe you've got a virus, meaning that the application does something that it's not designed to do. And of course we also have camouflage. This is where the virus will go through and hide itself so that it can't be detected. In fact some of the better viruses have been written so that they don't actually execute until they have spread as thoroughly as they can throughout the environment or throughout the host machine or network and then execute because then it's too late. Now I've got to go see what's causing all my issues. The signs and why. And for some reason I want to break out in a chorus of signs, signs, everywhere's a sign. Blocking up the scene, you breaking my mind. Okay, that may be really old school for some of you guys, huh? Well, we're going to go through and take a look at, first of all, why Oh, why do people make viruses? Well, there's several reasons. It's kind of like that issue of why did a man climb the mountain? Because it's there, right? But there are other reasons. Some of those reasons could be include financial reasons. Again, if I can trick you into thinking that your machine is broken and you have to pay me to get it fixed, that could be quite beneficial to me. Also, maybe I want to infect my competitors. I think I'm going to send an email right now to Troy Hunt and include a little gift. But seriously, there's been several cases where people have gotten in trouble for actually attacking their competitors via viruses and digital means, which by the way, it's illegal. Other reasons could also include research projects, trying to figure out the ins and outs or whys of different viruses. One of my favorites is, hey, that's a funny joke. Yeah, it's not funny. But some people do think it's kind of humorous to try to play a prank on somebody. Another reason could also include, hey, vandalism, especially when it comes to defacing or destroying content. There's also political reasons why folks do this. One of the most notable was a worm that was called Wank. Now it was rumored that this was actually created by some hackers in Melbourne and its political message when you got infected was the acronym Wank, which stood for Worms Against Nuclear Killers. This worm actually made its way around where it made its way into some systems at NASA and the Department of Energy. In fact, the ones at NASA, the computers were actually infected just a couple of days before the shuttle launch that was supposed to take the Galileo spacecraft up into orbit so that it could then go to Jupiter, and which I don't think it went anywhere else. In fact, as I remember, it crashed into Jupiter as its final mission objective. But there was actually some protesting going on at the time outside of NASA, and so it was rumored that maybe the worm had made its way in because of that particular launch. So what are some of the signs that maybe you're infected? Well, you might have drive issues, or better yet, your hard drive may be flashing, or hard drives may be flashing, even though nothing is running on the drives at the time, or the system's not under a load. Back in the old days with viruses, we would actually see a floppy drive kick on, even though there was no floppy disk inside, and that was a great indication that you've been infected. Also, you might have video issues, either not seeing what you'd expect to see or even possibly just the display looking strange. Another symptom would be filling up the memory completely so that the system slows way down, in some cases creating vulnerabilities or exploits. Another sign could be that just your applications are running slow or a particular application runs slow when you launch it. File names could turn strange if you start seeing strange characters show up in file names is another one as well. Or the system just totally freezing or locking up. In fact, I joke around in the previous section where I did my little Dale's Been Hacked section. It was kind of strange because my machine locked up pretty hard, which was a first for Windows 10 for me. Maybe Troy's heard me talk about him. Hmm... Okay, as far as deployment of viruses and worms is concerned, it's very similar to what we saw with Trojans, because again, it's just malware. And you can probably tell by my titles as I feel a little nostalgic with music as I created these slides. <laughs> so how does a virus and worm get around, round? I get around, yeah. 
Um, it, it does it very easily, especially with today's technology, with so many different devices out there and people are sharing so much information that we see it being deployed via downloads. People download files that they think are something that it's not, or even the aspect of, you've heard me mention it before, can you tell it's a little pet peeve of mine, pirated software? But one of the bigger ones is now email attachments. And not just email attachments, but also possibly social networking links. Another way that these bad boys get around is by people not updating their operating system or their applications or possibly even their antivirus. Let me tell you about my favorite scenario that I get at least once a year. And typically it's again done by family members where they're like, hey, Uncle Dale, I bought this new laptop and uh, it's starting to act kind of funny and I think I have a virus. And my first question to them is, besides the 30 day or 90 day evaluation of the antivirus product, have you paid for it so that you can continue to get updates? And when was the last time you downloaded the updates? And let me tell you, nine times out of 10, it's <laughs> funny you should mention that. And inside I'm like, yeah, funny you should call me. <laughs> but it's a real issue for us. And now I know that we see updates all the time for operating systems, but the same thing applies with your applications. Again, Microsoft is really nice about updating their applications, but what other applications are you running? And are your custom applications being updated to protect them from possible vulnerabilities of these viruses getting in. And speaking of apps, you got to really watch your plugins. Um, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more when I get into mobile devices. But one of the biggest issues I see happening today is that, you know, we install an application on our smartphones or our tablets and we get these updates. How many of you guys actually go back and review what the updates are going to update? Many times it's getting more permission to your resources, your contacts. Well, the same thing happens with plugins for applications. And one of the trickiest things we see taking place nowadays is compromise legitimate sites. And if you don't know how they do that, I highly recommend, see, I'm gonna put a plug in for Troy. Go watch his video on hacking web servers. Because if I can hack your web server and make it so that when you get online or you hit my website, I inject a virus on you. Or how about even drive-by downloads? This actually happens when somebody visits a website or maybe they look at an email message or maybe they get a pop-up window from the website that makes it look like an application. The most famous is obviously making it look like your antivirus is scanning your hard drives. And by clicking on the window to dismiss the advertisement, we actually install the virus. Another way is by spear phishing sites or even just straight out spear phishing. I usually make sure that I have my scuba tanks on. No, wrong kind. Um, spear phishing is basically where either an email or a website is portraying to be something that it's not. So for example, if I can DNS poison you so that you come to my version of a Citibank website, that would be a spear phishing site. And there I might ask you for things like, you need to reset your password. Please tell us what your current one is. Or if you get an email from eBay or PayPal saying, we need to verify you, please verify your birth date. Yeah, yeah, that's gonna happen, huh? Another famous one is what we refer to as clickjacking. This is actually where the attacker will use multiple transparent layers on the image so that even if you think you're closing the window or minimizing the window, you're actually clicking on OK. They also refer to this as a user interface readdress attack. So your countermeasure for that one is anytime you get a pop-up, never use the buttons to close or minimize. Or if you can't or don't have the capability of closing it down via the task manager, do yourself a favor. I know it's a long process, folks. Restart your machine. Just go to leave it up and running, go to the start button and restart the machine. And don't go back to that website. And a really, really interesting one that they're starting to see now is what we refer to as search engine optimization or SEO. What attackers are doing, let's say that you're looking for WinZip. Well, if I was to do a simple search, in fact, here, let me show you. So here I just opened up my browser and of course my home page is an awesome page. I'm gonna look for a program that's called 7-Zip. It's an alternative to WinZip, but it's free. Well, let's pretend like we're just a standard user. If I go to do a search for 7-Zip, you'll notice here that I, one of the top ones is 7-Zip.org. That looks legit, but there's also SourceForge. And then there's also download.cnet. There's also File Hippo. Here's another one, 7zip.en, softonic.com. 
Well, which one do you use? Which one's the vendor? And as I mentioned before, that's one thing that you'd want to do is find out who created it. I want to look at Wikipedia. And Wikipedia tells me that it is an open source, cross-platform, command line utility. I'm going to keep scrolling down here. They do reference here the 7-zip org main page as well as SourceForge. Let's go to 7-zip.org as well as let's back up and take a look at, I'll back up twice here. And let's take a look at the sourceforge.net. Notice it says who brought it to you or who was uh, who deployed this one. I would go back and check to see if this was the actual author. I'm very, very picky when I go to install. If we look at the history here. You can actually see the changes that have been made. This is just a standard text file, not showing me much. Let's go ahead and go back to 7-zip.org. I'm also going to be very careful, by the way, when I um, highlight or hover over a link, look at the bottom left-hand corner where it tells me where I'm getting the file from. So even though I want to grab a program really quickly, I still need to be careful about where I'm getting the program from. And listen, I get it. If you don't want to be careful, that's fine. Just send me your email and I'll send you my own copy of 7-Zip. So is the virus real or is it fake or does it even matter? Well, that really does depend on your victim. And what I mean by that is this. Well, sometimes we might get an email message that says something like this. Hey, your computer is probably infected with a virus. In turn, we have spread this virus to friends, family, and coworkers just by sending them email. Please read this and pass this on to anyone that you've sent email since September 11th. This was actually an email that people received that was referred to as the Baby New Year virus. It was totally fake. But obviously, what did they play on here? Well, when it comes to hoaxes, all the attacker is trying to do is to play on a fear. In this case here, the fear was surrounded around September 11th. That date has a significant inference to those of us who live in the United States or even worldwide. But a fake virus is simply just that. It's fake. It's a bluff. It may try to get us to do something that we normally wouldn't do. My favorite is when they tell you to send this out to everybody and make sure you include them in the header or how some people just forward the email and leave everybody's email address in the header, including the attacker who then gets a nice spam list. And there are actually some cases out there where the fake virus warning message actually contained a virus itself as well. So WTF, why the fake? Yeah, you're going a different direction, weren't you? Well, we typically see this again coming across as emails. So check the email headers. Make sure that just because it's, the email says it's from Dale Meredith, but the email address doesn't look right, I would be kind of suspicious of that. They might also try to get you to delete legitimate files. In fact, let me show you a real famous one here. We'll just do a quick search here. This was a, a fake virus that showed a teddy bear in the email. It basically went through and said, if you look on your system on your C drive, look for a file that was called JDBGM. And if it had a teddy bear associated to it, then you were infected. They said, oh, don't open it. You just need to delete it. Well, this was actually, this is what the icon looked like here. This was actually a legit file. It was a debugger for Java, which was only used by Microsoft. So deleting it didn't really do any harm in this particular case, but it did get people to think, oh no, I'm infected and my antivirus didn't pick it up. I need to go buy some new antivirus or just making me feel a little vulnerable. Sometimes we do the fake viruses to sell you something. Again, hey, your antivirus isn't very good. We'll, we'll talk about something very similar, which is fake antivirus but we could be trying to sell you a service of some sort. And as I mentioned earlier, the fake itself could have an attachment that has a virus. One of the most recent ones was an email going around saying, hey, everybody gets Windows 10 for free. Click on this link to get your free copy. Yeah. So again, some of the things you can do to stop yourself from falling for the fake is to do what we refer to as cross-checking cross-check to make sure just because somebody says hey this was on Oprah or this was on Coke's website well guess what it should be very easy to go find that out if it's posted in a news group if you're getting information from somebody who you don't know who they are or as I mentioned before check to make sure the emails coming from your friends actual email address if it's an issue as far as you know the government has said that this virus needs to be killed you need to check your hard drive to see if it's on there 
Well, guess what? If that type of information is going out, I guarantee whatever governing body has issued the release, it's going to be somewhere on their own website. And of course, you saw me earlier. One of the other things you can do is I always go look for websites that support hoaxed viruses that tell you all about them, like the one you just saw, Hoax Slayer. And as I mentioned before, be very, very careful about hoax or fake antivirus products or applications that promise to optimize your system, and they'll do it for free. Remember, nothing is ever free. Okay, so before we learn how to detect malware, we need to see how, first of all, how easy it is to create it. So we're gonna go to our evil laboratory and we'd like to cue the lightning and the evil laugh. Well, the creation of malware is extremely easy and I'm gonna show you some really, really basic methods that a user, whether it's a script kitty or some 12 year old somewhere, <laughs> that's figured out how to create a virus, how easy it is for them to do this. Then we'll go through and we'll get a little bit more complex. We'll use some additional tools that are out there for free, but I'm gonna give you a warning on some of these tools. The tools themselves may actually be mm, compromised. Is that the, uh, at risk there, we'll phrase it that way instead. But I want you to be able to see exactly what you're up against here. So we're gonna go through first of all, and we'll do something that's easy schmeasy. How easy? Well, we'll use Notepad to create a very simple program that's going to create a virus or that would be considered a virus. We'll also go through and take a look at a nifty little program that's called Terabit Virus Maker. And so you worms don't get feel left out. We'll break out something that we refer to as IWMT, which is short for Internet Worm Maker Thingy. Yeah, someone in marketing needs to be replaced, I think. So slap on the rubber gloves and let's get going here. Okay, so I'm just here on my Windows 7 box. Again, this is my virtual machine. Um, one thing I want to do here, though, is I want to come in and I'm going to create a snapshot of this machine because what I'm about to do can be really kind of destructive. So I'm going to go ahead and just do a checkpoint is what we also refer to them as in the later versions of Server 2012. Wait for that to complete. Okay, so now that snapshot is created, we're going to go back into our virtual machine here. So if I break anything too badly, I can always revert back. So let's first of all, open up Notepad. And you could use WordPad as well. Notepad's gonna be a little bit faster for me. You could even use Microsoft Word if you wanted to get really crazy. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go through and do a echo off, which basically says, don't show me anything. Don't display anything to me. And then I'm gonna create a entry point, which I shouldn't say an entry point, but it's a reference point. And it can be anything you want. I can type anything. Or in my case, I'm feeling like a little Batman today, so I'm going to just call the reference point Batman. And then I'm going to use a command. Watch this. I'm going to just show you what the command does itself. I'm going to just open up a command prompt. And if I type in the command start, it just opens up another command prompt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say run start. And then I'm going to say go to colon Batman. And you can see what's gonna happen here is it's just gonna simply loop. So if I save this, I'm gonna save it as Batman. And we'll come down here, we'll change it to all files, we'll put it on the desktop, and we're gonna call it batman.bat. So it's a batch program, so it'll execute. And so let's go ahead and execute this bad boy. Now real quick, I'm gonna Come over here and take my virtual machine. I'm not going to make it full size. I'm going to make it so that you can see my CPU usage. Notice it's just at a simple 1%. If I execute this bad boy, first of all, it doesn't look like anything's going on, but look at my CPU usage just jumped up to 21%. And most people would just take this and go, oh, what the crud is this? I'm just going to close this down. Well, this is continuing. Matter of fact, look, it won't even close, or the system's gonna become extremely, extremely slow in response. Oh, there we go. And there goes oodles and oodles and oodles. You can see my CPU usage has gone up. Go ahead and maximize this again so you can see them. I got tons of command prompts going on here. And eventually, my machine's gonna crash out on me. In fact, I can't do anything at this point. Yay, we broke it. Okay, this is why you can see that I love doing snapshots, because I'm just going to come back to my snapshot and, oops, 
There's my snapshot. I'm going to simply select to apply it. And my machine should revert back here. There we go. And log back in. Okay, and now we're back to our Windows 7 machine. Now that's really basic. But using the same concept here, if you understand command line, again, we're just going to open up Notepad again. Again, I'm going to just do an echo off. We're going to get a reference point here, and we'll just call this one website, websites. And then we're going to say start www.google.com. Start www.espn.com. Start www.sears.com. Let's uh, ping. We'll ping yahoo.com. And we'll add a little ping command here. I don't want to see the output. And then we'll just type in go to websites. Yeah, can you see what's going to happen here? Let's save this again on the desktop. I call this one joker.bat. Now, I know what some of you guys may be saying, and we've talked about this earlier, and that is, well, you know, if I saw this file, it's a batch program, I wouldn't necessarily execute it. But the issue here is that people can be tricked into executing them. For example, I'm going to go ahead and call this one hot picks of batman.jpg.bat. Now, because of the default setting of the Windows platform, which is to hide the file extensions of known file extensions, notice that the batch program or the .bat extension is gone. Now, I know you want to see those hot pics of uh, Batman, but uh, unfortunately, since I'm not hooked up to the internet, nothing's going to work. At least, remember, these virtual machines are completely compartmentalized here, so they don't have access to the internet. But, you know, when you start thinking again outside the box, I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do. I could do a, a task kill explorer.exe, and that's not File Explorer, folks. Well, it includes File Explorer, but it's your main interface. And if I just have that looping, you'll never be able to get into your system. I could create folders and directories on top of your desktop or in your hard drive. There's all kinds of things I can do. And again, this, these are very, very basic. And as far as catching this in an antivirus product, this is just simply a batch program. So this is why we don't execute files that are sent to us via email when we don't know who the person is that's sending them to us. Okay, let's get a little bit more advanced here. Let me close this down. Now here comes my disclaimer. In the files section, you're going to see a couple of files that may or may not make sense to you. Uh, it does say terabit virus maker as well as my internet worm maker thingy, but I changed the extensions. And the reason why I did that was because I don't want the antivirus to kick this out. And in some cases, it might still pop up on you. So you may have to turn off your antivirus. Yeah, see, I knew that's kind of scary though, huh? And again, I would want you to be careful because I can't guarantee the safety of these particular products. They're kind of out there in the wild, and that's why I only run them on virtual machines. And just to kind of show you, I'm going to go to my documents here so you can, whoops, excuse me, my down, desktop, there we go, so you can see this. I'm going to change out my settings so that you can see the extensions. So now you can see that I named them .text, um, both of these. And what I'm going to do first is we're going to take the terabits virus maker and I'm going to just simply rename it. Just drop out the text or the txt extension and now it's going to be a 7-zip. So now that it's a 7-zip file, I should be able to just simply come in here. You'll have to make sure you install 7-zip on your virtual machine. I'm just going to go ahead and extract this out to a directory on my hard drive or on the desktop. Let's go in and take a look at this bad boy. So I'm just going to run my setup here, take my defaults, and there's my little icon. We're going to say it installed correctly. And let's go ahead and run this. So you can see this one here is a little more GUI friendlier base, but you can see what I can do. I can avoid it so they can't open up the calculator, so that they can't open up Notepad, WordPad, delete files from the My Documents folder, disable the CMD or the command prompt. Maybe I want to delete Windows fonts. Very destructive things here. I can disable the Task Manager. 
so they can't get into the task manager. I can turn off the firewall. For oh, let's just format all the hard drives. What do you say? Or you know, <laughs> funny keyboard and funny mice and a funny start button. Yeah, that's that's a great trick to play. I can hide desktop icons. And what you do is you go over and you say, okay, this is the virus that I'd like to create. And we talked about wrapping and binding earlier in the course. And I'm going to come up here. It has its own built-in binder for me and say, I'd like to bind that into, and we're going to come down and let's just grab Windows System 32. We're going to bind this virus. I'm scrolling down. Come on. Give me something here fun. Oh, well, you know, I could do that. I could have it bind to a to a screensaver. So if they install my screensaver and it executes, I'm going to have some fun with them, huh? Or let's do this. Um, we're going to hook it up to Notepad. We can create a fake error message so we misdirect them. I can execute a custom command if I'd like. And what's the name of the file you want to call it? After it's been installed, we can make it look like it's just the spool service running. We can give it, here's an icon that we can give it. A setup icon, a Yahoo icon. And what's the name of the file that's going to be called after it's bound? Well, we're going to call this one Hot Picks of Robin. Select Create the Virus. It says, where do you want to create it? We'll just create it on the desktop. Yeah, you can see here it's picked up a, a security threat. So let's come in here real fast. And we're going to allow that. Technically, I should probably come in here and turn off the Defender. We'll just get rid of the real-time protection. Let's try that again. There we go. So it says it's created. And all we have to do is execute it. And it would obviously, obviously go through and do those things that we've selected to do. Prove it, Dale. Okay, let's see what happens here. So there's Notepad. Oh, but it shut down because I'm avoiding to open Notepad. Okay, fine. Let's open up Calculator. Huh, that won't open. Well, let me get to a command prompt. That one seemed to work. That's interesting. Only thing I can think of is that um, when this program was written, it may have been a different execution call that it made that should have blocked it. Let's see if we can pull up Task Manager. Oh, see, that one's pulling up too. That's okay. You guys get the concept. Again, not everything is 100% for us. That's cool, Dale. I know. Let's go ahead and do the same thing and take a look at our Internet Worm Maker thingy. We're going to just get rid of the text file or text extension. Let's go ahead and unzip that bad boy. Yeah, dang it. Oh, it's Security Essentials. I was thinking Defender. So let me turn off security essentials here. Come into settings, real time, turn that bad boy off. Okay, so let's come in here and play this bad boy. We're gonna select here the generator, and you can see very similar, but a little bit different because this is, this is a program that'll create a worm. And if you remember the differences between the virus and the worm is that a worm doesn't require the user to execute anything. I can just, if I can get this on your system, I'm gonna go through and do all these different features. You know, maybe I'm gonna change it to Spanish startup. Give it a name and an author. Of course, you know, I wanna identify myself. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Same concept here. I can hide the drives, disable log offs. I can do pop-up messages. I can disable malware removal. I can hide uh, virus files. I can infect VBS or batch programs. I can execute a screen of death. CPU monster just hogs up the CPU. And after you're done filling out this information, you just simply generate the worm. And my next goal is to try to get it on your machine. And now you can see how easy it is. Therefore, now you understand the numbers behind the fact that they say that nearly 1 million new malware threats are released every day. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is a Windows computer. I work here. I'm a security professional. It was a night like any other... Eh, okay, I'll stop that. 
investigation of malware. So in this module, we're going to go through and take a look at how we investigate or look at what malware is actually doing. And in order to understand how to do this, we first need a place to start. And I'm just going to let that picture sink in for a second. Yeah, isn't that great? Anybody want to take a stab at this one? Yeah, I'm going to talk about something called sheep dip. Thank you. Thank you. Now, a sheep dip is simply a system that is set up to check the physical media, device drivers, and other files before the malware actually infects this particular machine. So you're going to start off with an extremely clean environment. And if you follow Superdale's rules, a great candidate for a sheet dip computer would be a virtualized machine. In fact, some of the steps we went through to set up our lab environment is very similar to the same steps that you go through to configure a sheet dip system. Now, again, typically this computer is used for nothing but a way of isolating and monitoring everything that's going on as you execute the piece of malware. I wanted to do that with several different pieces of software. We might have some antivirus software, as well as some tools for monitoring registry entries, as well as even ports. So the actual setup for a sheep dip is we're going to start with basically, again, our host machine, and we're going to install some type of virtualization. After we install the virtualization, we'll then want to go through and make sure that we quarantine the network. Again, very similar to what we did in Understanding Ethical Hacking series, so that anything we do on this machine won't affect our production environment. You'll also want to go through and make sure that you disable any type of shared folder services that are going on, or any of the services that might leak out from the virtual into the host environment. But typically, again, if you quarantine the network, you should be good to go. You'll then want to copy over the malware that you discovered. And this can sometimes also be a challenge because you may be saying, well, how do you get the malware into the virtual machine? And this depends on the virtualization that you're dealing with. You've seen how I've been able to do some transferring of files, and I actually do that between the virtual machine and the host machine. And after I make the transfer, I disconnect the host machine so it no longer talks to the virtual machine. Some virtualization technologies support the ability to map out to physical USB drives, which also works. Maybe you have a thumb drive that you've copied the malware profile over to. After you copy the malware over, you'll want to yell for your assistant typically Igor, and tell him to cue the Fender and Lightning machine and you begin to rub your hands together. Now, before you actually launch it, you're going to use some utilities that are going to help you to track what's going on. Now, there are several different pieces of software out there that can help you at different levels of, anal of doing your analysis of malware. One of the more popular ones is actually a product that's called Bintext. Now, Bintext allows you to extract out text from any of your files or any of the files, including the ability to define string values that may be in a binary file. This will actually help you to find any type of files that have been wrapped inside of the executable. You can also use a product like UPX. Now UPX, and no, I'm not talking about UPS, but UPX is a free portable executable packer for several different platforms, including Linux, Windows, Windows CE, Mac OS, DOS, FreeBSD. But with it, you're able to go through and decompress the files without having to actually install the file. UPX is a open source product, so you don't have to worry about shelling out any bucks for it. Other pieces of software that you may want to take a look at is some type of software that's going to monitor your ports. Check to see what activity fires up when you execute your suspected file. We have to refer to this as the file trying to phone home. Now, there are a couple different products that you can use out there. Some of the more popular ones, again, they're popular because typically they're less than a penny, like Wireshark. Microsoft has its own port monitoring software as well. I'm sure you've come across your own favorite version of this type of software. The other thing you may want to take a look at too is Sysinternals has a fantastic suite of tools. And one of my more favorite ones is again, Process Explorer, which I've shown you in previous courses, as well as Process Monitor. Process Monitor allows you to again, see everything that's going on in real time with file systems, with the registry, while Process Explorer shows you all the processes that are currently executing. The next step that you'd want to go through when you're analyzing your malware is to debug some stuff. So what we're looking for is the installation instructions. 
as well as the installation locations. Now there are some specific locations that if I can get my piece of malware inside of those locations, such as the registry or even sp some specific directories, I can make sure that the application or my piece of malware will execute every single time. Now, one of my favorite programs to use as far as looking for stuff that's been installed, or I should say it's quick and dirty, is something called auto runs. This is also done by Sys Internals. This is actually coming off of my physical laptop here that I'm using while I'm recording. And so you can see things where they're running from. So I've got, you know, HK Local Machine Software, Microsoft, Windows, current version, run. And I've got uh, both my audio driver as well as my touchpad driver. You can see I've got some Dropbox going on, Java going on, my VPN product. Looks like I may have a couple of uh, things that are no longer there that I can get rid of. But when you're debugging, I obviously don't want to install the malware just to see where it put the code in. Instead, we can use something like IDA Pro. Now, this is actually a product by a company called Hexrays.com. And it has the ability or it has built into it a disassembler as well as a debugger system. And it allows you to go through and look at any software vulnerabilities as well as its interaction that it'll have when it installs. And again, we could spend hours just looking at that particular product, but just a, just a neat little program that a lot of antivirus companies use as well as anybody that's involved in research, or I should say security research. In fact, I was just reading an article today that mentioned that the uh, NSA, which is the National Security Administration here in the United States, that they are posting or making everybody aware of the zero-day malware technologies being utilized, but they won't reveal whether or not they're using it themselves. Huh. There's some other resources that you can use as well to help you out. There's this thing out there, it's called the Internet. You guys ever heard of that? And there's a quiz later. But there are several different companies that have what we refer to as online malware testing. One of the most popular ones is one called Virus Total. With Virus Total, in fact, here, let me just fire this up real fast. So Virus Total allows you to take a file that you may suspect is corrupt and upload it to them, and they will check it up to 128 megs in, in size, and they'll check it to see if it has any type of suspicious programming associated to it. They also have the ability for you to look at any websites that may be questionable as well. In fact, let's see if we can get a result here. Here's a, a site that is considered suspicious. So it looks like uh, there's some detection. Yeah, Bitdefender picked it up as a phishing site. A lot of other people have claimed it as being clean. Let's go back and let's do another one here. And the issue here is... Obviously, when you look at a URL, you might not be willing to click on it. But the bigger issue is this, is we have the, the, the latest trend, especially on the net, social networking side of things. We have this trend about shortening the URLs and putting those links in, right? So be very careful about clicking on a shortcut URL because it could actually take you to a site that is completely malicious. There's also the Malware Protection Center. There's several of these sites that are out there. Just make sure it's a legitimate site. I've actually seen some sites that say that they will help you scan. Just come to their site and they'll, they'll, they'll tell you if it's infected or not. And they themselves are a website that's injecting malware on you. Pretty funny. Uh, Avast is another one. They have their own online scanner as well. And when it comes to training of our end users, you need to make sure that we or that they understand completely that when we get links in emails, that we don't just necessarily take it for granted. That's where that link is going to actually go. It may say www.microsoft.com, but the HTML code on the back of that might be taking you to you just been hacked.com. So my general rule of thumb is even if I get a email from a friend, because again, people's emails accounts can be compromised, but if there's a URL listed in the email, I will highlight what is being shown to me visually, copy it, and then paste it inside of my browser. Because again, I can't guarantee that link. Okay, tools in our utility belt. Ooh, time for a little trivia, you ready? What happens when you string together 16 elements of sodium? And if you don't know the answer, I'll tell you at the end but there could be clues throughout this module. So some of these tools, you should really, really be familiar with them. Uh, if not, have them in your own little arsenal. 
The first one I'd like to show you is one just simply called TCP view. This is very much like a net stat, but through an application. And what you're able to do with TCP view is see everything that's going on, all your connections being made via the network or via the internet itself. So here I go. I'm going to go ahead and install it real fast or run it. And you can see, matter of fact, let's go ahead and make this biggie size. You can see everything that's currently going on on my machine. You can obviously see I've got several versions of Chrome opened up. So when you see the red lines flash up, these are actually executables that are stopping or possibly processes, I should not phrase it that way, that are stopping. And when we see green ones, they're processes that are starting up. So again, you can see everything that's going on as far as what port it's using, number of packets being sent and received. You can also sort it by the number of packets. Let's go all the way, here we go. Uh, you can also do, here's the send packets. And you should be able to come in here and for example, here's Outlook. If you right click on it, you can go to the process properties. You can close the connection. You can do a who is real quick. Why that doesn't give me who is, I don't know. because I've got an IP address. Let's try this one here. If I do a who is, there we go. It tells me who the domain is owned by and the IP address. So that's why, because the IP address has already been resolved. Another program you should become familiar with, I kind of showed it to you earlier, but it's called Auto Runs. And again, Auto Runs shows you everything that's going on with your machine at a particular time. And it breaks it down to different tabs of focus. So you can see everything that's currently running. You can see the login information, or I should say what's starting up on login. We have uh, also Explorer. We have Internet Explorer files uh, that are being utilized. We've got scheduled tasks going on, services that are currently running drivers, here are my boot executes, known DLLs, I can come in and look at my office information. So you can see here that, you know, link here fires up for me whenever I boot up my machine. Uh, they also have some stuff in here for like WMI, network providers, uh, as well as print monitors, but I don't have any of those running right now. Go back here to everything and you can filter out and say, you know, please show me everything from, let's do OneDrive. And there's everything that's going on about OneDrive which is also known as SkyDrive from the old days. You also have several different options where I can go through and say, you know what, just hide all the Microsoft products so I don't have to see those. The reason why these are still here is because I've got some empty directories, it looks like, that I could clean up. But again, if I go in my Explorer, actually let's clear out this filter. You'll notice now I don't see any Microsoft products listed in here because I've dropped those out. And they also have a direct link here to uh, your virus total clean entries, so I can hide, hide those. So that's just a little bit about auto runs. Another, another nifty little tool. Another tool that we will want to take a look at is called driver view. Now driver view is exactly what it sounds like. It's a neat little program that goes through and shows you everything about your drivers that you currently have loaded on your machine. Again, this is coming off my laptop here. So I can go through and see different drivers and they go through and tell you some of them that may be borderline uh, and you'll want to make sure that you understand basically every driver that has in, been installed on your machine. If you find one, let's see, I think I saw one up here that, yep, so I've got one that's called dump disk. Should be able to Google search that bad boy. Let's see what it says. So we'll just come in here and it looks like, yep, this is a uh, program. If I scroll down here, I've seen this one before where, uh, it's used to dump files for Microsoft so that they can, you know, when you have a, a crash and Microsoft wants to send a report, well, they do that via this driver. And of course, again, we have options to go through and read the digital signatures of a driver. Let's move this over here a bit so we can see this. Actually, let's move this all the way out. There we go. So you can go through and choose which columns you want to appear. So it's added the digital signature all the way over here. Oop, come on, there we go. If there's any digital signature associated to them. And of course we can do the same thing where we can go through and say, please hide all the Microsoft drivers. And now these are the drivers I'd probably really want to go take a look at. Let's go ahead and minimize this. And finally we have a nifty tool that's built into all of our Windows platforms that's called the SFC or the System File Checker Tool. Now this particular tool is kind of cool because it goes through and it'll scan your system for any corruption of Windows system files and it'll restore those corrupted files. Or if they've gotten deleted, it'll also restore those. Now this is an easy one to do. 
All we do is open up a command prompt. Now you'll need to make sure that you've opened it with administrative level privileges, which means you're going to right click on it and select run as administrator. And from there, you just simply type in, well, let's get the help first, which is SFC with a slash question mark. And it shows you that you can do a slash scan now, which goes through and checks and repairs any files if it's able to do that. You can do a verify only, which scans but doesn't do any type of protection. And then you can get real specific. If you're looking for a particular file that you may suspect is corrupt, you can do a slash scan file or verify file. So as an example, I can say, let's do a SFC and we'll just do a scan now. Actually, let's just do a verify. So it'll take a little while for it to go through and do. I'm going to pause the video and we'll come back so you can see what it was able to discover, if anything. Okay, so it completed its scan and you'll notice that it says that it found some integrity violations. And uh, I went to I actually pause the video a little bit longer because I was like, uh oh, what the crud's going on? Um, it didn't try to fix them, but what I've discovered that because I'm running Windows 10 and I'm also still participating in the Insider Preview builds, even though that 10 is officially out. I am running 10, but um, as an insider, I'm able to get some of the newer features before they release them out. And so I think that's what's causing my problem here. At least, at least that's what everyone suspects. Or maybe I'm infected. Dun, 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 dun. By the way, answer the question, anybody remember? Well, here's the answer. Batman. Okay, so in this module, we went and took a look at how to actually go through and create a piece of malware, whether it's a worm or a virus. We saw some very easy ways of doing it, as well as some more complex ways using some applications. And we could get even more complex by breaking out some development tools, but that's not my skill set. Then once we got our piece of malware, we were able to look at how we would go through and do an analysis of the malware using, remember our famous computer that's been sheep dipped? Again, that's just a clean system with some specific utilities on it that helps us to look at what the malware does as you install. And remember, we're looking at things such as registry entries, ports, services that are running, Oh, just as a side note, back in the old days, malware creators would put their product inside of the Windows System 32 directory, and we're seeing a transition here. Uh, now they're starting to put it inside of the actual user's profile location. And the reason why they're doing that is, anybody know? Bueller? Bueller? Anyone? Anyone? It's because of the UAC. Because remember, when you, at least in Windows, when you try to do something or run a program that's going to affect the system, if it's running outside of the user's profile, it's going to prompt them for credentials. By placing the malware inside the user's profile, it executes a lot easier, which actually makes it easy as far as scanning directories looking for issues. Now we don't have to worry about checking just Windows or System32. We can just, on the newer OSs, just check the profile section. And then finally, we went through and took a look at our famous utility belt and what tools that we should really become comfortable with, at least for your immediate future. So now that we've talked about malware, let's finally, in the next module, talk about the countermeasures or some best practices when it comes to dealing with malware. Now, as far as virus discovery methods are concerned, you need to know that First of all, there's not a single great solution out there. It's a combination of things. And when we first start talking about these different discovery methods, the first one that obviously comes to everybody's mind is the scanning. Now, when we're talking about scanning, all we're talking about here is basically having some type of antivirus solution installed on your systems to help protect it. Now, again, I'm not here to tell you guys which is the best antivirus product out there to use. In fact, I think that's all based off of time frame because literally in a month or two months or three months, it always changes in who everybody thinks is the best. I will throw a little plug in. I know that Microsoft's Forefront Security Solutions um, actually has up to five antivirus scanning engines for the Exchange servers, which is kind of cool. And I wish we had more and more solutions that were that flexible. Unfortunately, that also slows things down, right? And you have to remember that these antivirus products are only able to find malware that they're aware of. So if it's a zero-day malware, the odds are it's not going to find it. 
which always leads me down the road of, you know, the famous stories of my nieces and nephews contacting me or even friends about something's happened to my machine, Uncle Dale. And my first question is, is your antivirus up to date? And it's always, oh, yeah, it expired last month. Now, there's also some common sense items that we can apply as well as make sure we teach to our users. And that is when it deals with emails. Here's a golden rule for you. If it looks suspicious, then consider it suspicious. If you're not expecting an email from somebody and they send one to you out of the blue with weird subjects or, hey, check out this link or the header looks like it's similar to an email address of a relative or someone that you know, do me a favor, don't click on it. Unless it's from me, then go ahead and click on it. Yeah. Now, in the background of what's happening during scanning is that when a virus gets detected, obviously the antivirus vendors are going to start to look at different ways that they can identify this particular virus. They usually do this with what they refer to as a signature string. Now, these strings are extracted from the virus, and they're added as a declaration of being infected to their antivirus database. So as they scan your system, if the strings match, you'll be warned. Now, one of the tricky things that takes place here is that when a malicious hacker writes a virus, he'll often try to create viruses just by simply modifying existing ones. That's why we always have these variations of the same virus over and over. For example, my doom had several different variations. And the reason why the malicious attackers do this is that it, the frequent changes actually throw off the scanners because there's new signature strings that are being generated. Now, they not only rely on these signature strings, but the antivirus companies will use what they refer to as code analysis. This is typically the difference between a quick scan and a thorough scan. A quick scan is just looking at strings where the in-depth scans are typically looking a little bit deeper into your files to see if any of the code resembles that which they've already discovered off these new pieces of malware. The next method of discovery is what we refer to as integrity checking. Now, these type of products can actually go through and verify, and some of these are actually now built into our operating systems, especially when it comes to the Windows platform, the latest and greatest by Microsoft, where the OS actually checks to see if the core files or system files have been modified or they would consider them corrupt and if so it'll try to recover those for you. Now in your immediate future you might see something about integrity checking in particular two different products one called Tripwire or one that's built into the operating system for Microsoft and that is Sigverf and Sigverf just simply goes through and helps to verify the integrity of your critical files on your system. Tripwire is actually a company that makes a file integrity and change monitoring system that's designed for the enterprise level. It actually monitors in real time, tells you who, what, where, when a file is modified. And then next we have interception. This method actually utilizes what we refer to as interceptors. So an interceptor simply maintains or looks at the requests that are made to the operating system for network access as well as some specific actions that helps to identify threats that are being made to programs. If it sees one of these threats come up, the interceptor will typically have a pop-up to notify the user that they're about to do something or something's about to take place that makes a change. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about here, right? If you're from the Windows world, we refer to it as the UAC, which is that feature of Windows that everybody seems to disable. They don't understand what's happening here is that the UAC is designed to protect you. And we have the same thing when it comes to both Linux and iOS when you get the prompts to enter in a root password, right? So you can see that because there are different methods of discovery, this is a continual battle. And personally, I don't think there's a single best solution. I think it's always a combination of things. It's not always software driven. Although software does help us, to me there's a lot of common sense that needs to be deployed. Oh, Alfred, go get me my master list please. Okay. I wish it was that easy. Or maybe I could do an Igor thing here. Yes, master. No? Neither one? Okay, so this master list of countermeasures, this is kind of my own best practices uh, that I've come up with. And some of them have also been talked about in various publications that are out. So the first thing you need to understand when it comes to this list is that there are three levels, 
meaning that we have three different areas that we need to make sure that we're protecting. The first area or the first level is at the server or from the server perspective. We're going to have different products, different solutions for our servers than that which we would have for our desktop machines or laptops or our mobile devices. Please, please, please protect your mobile devices, guys. Now, just because you have protection in place at the server level doesn't mean that the desktops don't need to be covered as well. That's a very, very bad decision to make. I hear sometimes people go, well, we've got antivirus on our servers that scans everything. Really? So when somebody plugs in a USB drive that they picked up in the parking lot because Dale was in your parking lot earlier, how's the server going to handle that? So you should have desktop solutions as well as the server. And again, vice versa. You know, if you've got stuff installed on your desktops, that doesn't mean that the servers are completely safe. Then there's also another level, and that is the physical side. Because when it comes to ethical hacking, the thing that you need to understand is that attackers, not only are they looking for ways of getting into your environment, but it'd be really easy to get into your environment if I can steal your laptop, or if I can steal your phone, or your tablet. So when we talk about the physical security side of things, we need to make sure that we have things in place like locked doors. I don't know how many times I've seen a server sitting in an open room, or my favorite is in a closet in a hallway in an office environment. Yeah, nothing bad's going to ever happen there. Other obvious solutions for physical security would also be who has physical access to the office environment itself. Uh, and there are different things that you can do to solve that. There's what they refer to as a man trap, which contrary to popular belief was not the first girl that I dated. Thank you. Thank you. No, a man trap is one of those areas where you walk through one door and it locks behind you and you can't open up the next door until it has locked or somebody has approved you. Therefore, it locks you inside of this area. And I guess technically, if we're supposed to be politically correct, we should just call this a person trap. So what are my list of countermeasures? Well, so I'm going to start off with the obvious, and that would be antivirus. We've already talked about this, but again, you need to make sure that you're going to have antivirus solutions for your desktop machines as well as for your servers. You might actually have antivirus solutions for products. Many antivirus software solution providers or vendors have not only just the basic, I want to you know, scan your desktop and your servers, um, all their files for viruses or malware, but they might actually have a plugin specific to an application such as SQL or maybe Exchange or SharePoint. And how many of you guys are running antivirus on your mobile devices? Uh-oh. The next one is going to be to create a policy for your company so people understand how to handle malware. Now, it's not going to be just one policy. You're going to have a policy for antivirus as far as what to do when somebody thinks they get infected. You're going to have an email server policy as far as how we plan on protecting the email server. You're going to have email malware scanning policies. When do we scan? How often do we scan? Who's in charge of updating those definitions? We're going to come up with a policy. It's probably going to be one of the bigger ones of which file attachments do you block? I know some companies who block not only the standard, you know, like executables and batch programs, but I've seen some companies block zip files or SCR files, which are your screensaver files or reg files. And the policy needs to say things like, if we detect it, what do we do? Do we quarantine it? Do we quarantine it then delete it after so many days? Or do we just whack it the first chance we get? We're also going to come up with what we refer to as a network exploit protection policy. And this is typically the policy that we use as far as how to handle remote users and mobile devices. Like if I come in from the outside via VPN and I'm using my home PC, hopefully you're going to limit me so that I don't have necessarily the same access to all the files on the network that I might have when I'm in physically at my office. And after you create these policies, you've got to make sure that you then share them and have training on them in your networked environment. In fact, I know my wife's company has them sign that they've read the policy because guess what? Doing certain things will get you an extended leave of absence. Another countermeasure would be watching the downloading. And what I mean by that is this. When you go to install an application. They may give you some instructions on how to download and install. What I mean by this is, I'm sure you've all experienced this before, is that you'll go to download a piece of software and there's this big green button that says download and you think that that is the link to download the file that you're looking for, but in actuality you're downloading something else. Or the instructions for downloading on the website might tell you to 
disable certain things. As I've mentioned before as well, it just drives me crazy. Sometimes I'll be in these forums or blog sites and they'll say, hey, in order to install this, you've got to jump through these hoops like, you know, disable your antivirus because you might get a false positive if you really want to have a good laugh. Now, you guys know that I am not a big fan of torrents, but go look at some of these torrent sites and look at some of the comments that people make about installing the old Office 2013. They'll say, hey, you know, my antivirus said that there was a piece of malware in there. And the author will say, oh, no, that's just a false positive because of the hack that we used. Yeah, I'm not thinking I'm buying that one. Another countermeasure would be to obviously make sure that you keep your software up to date. Now, I know that we are, at least you better be religious, about updating your antivirus, right? Everybody nod your head. Okay, what about your OS? Now, I get it. A lot of people go, you know, we wait until patches have been released for 30 or 60 days before we implement them. Yeah, so that's 30 or 60 days that you're open to that vulnerability. When it comes to Microsoft patches, folks, let me tell you, um, the critical updates, you've got to install those. Those are not necessarily designed to do anything crippling to your environment. It's to patch a hole that's in your environment that Microsoft is aware of. They're trying to help you. So I tell my students that critical updates, they get deployed immediately. And I would say the same thing for Apple as well as Linux. And then also make sure that your applications, whether it's desktop applications as well as the server application side of things. When we talk about server applications, I'm talking about applications that run on server. That's not Word or Excel, that's Exchange or SQL. You gotta keep this stuff up to date. And please, please don't forget the updates on your mobile devices. Another countermeasure for you is attachment issues. <laughs> You know, there's a joke here, right? I have attachment issues. <laughs> what we mean by this is try not to open attachments. Okay, a side note here. I know that we typically say, our users are stupid. They're idiots. Can you believe they did this or that? Okay, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. Yeah, but you know what? They're not as dumb as they used to be. Those of us that have been around for 10 or 15, 20 years in this industry, our users were really, really intelligent challenged when it came to handling emails. But attackers are getting very, very tricky. In fact, just today, my wife got an email. Here, let me bring it up for you so you can see this. So check this out. You can see my wife's response. Uh, we don't have a United Automobile account. And of course, I've redacted private information because I don't need you guys sending her emails narking on me. But check this out. Um, down here it says, you know, dear valued member, we've been receiving complaints of an unauthorized usage of your USAA online banking system. And due to, concern, due to the concerns regarding safety integrity of your USAA membership, we hereby issue this warning message. And they tell you to go through here uh, and update your records. And how they want you to update it is to please download, open the document attached in this email and follow the instructions. So look at the download. It looks like it's a document if you don't finish the sentence out, right? So they're becoming, and oh, this is my favorite too, is check out the bottom. Oh, they even copyrighted this. And look, they even quoted things like, you know, member FDIC. And this is one of the main reasons why I knew it was spam is because we don't have a normal bank. We use a credit union. Oh crap, you're going to use that against me now, aren't you? The other thing you want to make sure that you take a look at with attachments is making sure that you block file attachments that have more than one file type extension associated to it, like a form.doc.txt or form.doc.bat. Another countermeasure that we'll want to use is, where's this coming from? Who's the source of this file? So as I showed you earlier, when I go to download a piece of software, I always make sure I go to the legitimate source. Same thing with drivers, folks. I don't go to Billy Bob's download driver page to get my drivers. I got burned on that one once before. Another countermeasure would include obviously keeping informed. The one thing you want to do as a security expert or an ethical hacker is that you've got to keep up to date. And this means daily, if not hourly in some cases. When a zero day attack is announced, keep up to date what's going on with it. Besides obviously scanning your environment. Another countermeasure, which should speak for itself, your antivirus should be running daily. I'm sure someday it may come down to hourly. Actually, I think before that happens, we will have found them all, strung them up, and caned them. The malware creators. That's who I'm talking about here, guys, okay? Another countermeasure would be 
checking your media, your DVD, your CDs. Actually, I guess we could talk about USB drives here as well. There are so many people that are burning DVDs, and they may burn them at home because they have documents and stuff that they want to, yeah, I know, a DVD full of documents, that's a lot of data. But they, maybe they've got movies on it and, and music that they want to bring to work. Well, if their system's infected, you should have a policy about what is allowed to be brought in. In fact, I'm not a big fan of having optical drives in desktop systems just because of that issue. In fact, i got to tell you my story here. I had a friend who went to China, uh, and he came back with a DVD and handed it to me and said, you're welcome, Dale, and he thought he was all cool, and I went, well, what's this? And he said, oh, I bought it for $15, Dale. It's every product Microsoft makes. And I'm like, yeah, like I'm going to put this in my machine, right? Now I know that's pirated software. In fact, as I recall, it also had semantic antivirus on it as well that I could install. And I'm sure that was legit and not infected whatsoever. Another countermeasure is watching your pop-ups. You need to make sure that your pop-up blocker is on on your web browsers. And malware creators are getting quite creative with, oh crap, I, I must have a virus, guys. Hang on. Now, this is a great example of those stupid, silly pop-ups, but it tricks people. It socially engineers them in the aspect of, if you look at this, it looks like it's AVG antivirus, but look at the border. This is a Internet Explorer pop-up window with, doesn't have the URL bar. And because they're really smart, this is typically an animated GIF file. So it looks like it's scanning. And no matter where I click, even if I click the close, button, I actually end up getting infected. So be very careful and vigilant about blocking pop-ups. Another countermeasure, your chat files. Now the reason why we talk about this is because of the social networking environment where people are chatting back and forth. Hey, I happen to like Batman too. You want to see a really cool Batman screensaver? Let me send you a file. I'm like, yeah, I just met you. And your handle is Oswald Cobblepot. Yeah, you're going to have to look that one up. Another countermeasure for you is the firewall in UAC. Okay, I'm going to get up my soapbox here. You're like, oh no, another one. So I get it. My, everybody hates the Microsoft firewall, and they hate the UAC. This is that annoying pop-up that says, are you sure you want to do this? And I get it. As an administrator, I'm like, of course I want to do it. I'm the one who typed in regedit. Or it's too much of a hassle to configure the Windows firewall. We don't need to worry about the Windows firewall internally. We're protected from the outside. We have a hardware-based firewall. Well, guess what? Again, some of your attacks are not going to come from the outside. A lot of them are going to come from the inside. And believe it or not, the UAC is there to just remind you, hey, you're about to make a change that is going to make a change to the system itself. Are you really sure you want to do this? And what's so funny about this is that Microsoft gets hammered for this thing. Yet, what does Linux do? And Apple... Hmm. Okay, full disclosure here, guys. I have a laptop that I travel with, that I train with, and I do turn the UAC off on that because when I'm doing presentations or demos, I don't want to have to waste time by clicking OK. But all my servers at my house, my kids' machines, my wife's machine, every other machine in my environment, the UAC is enabled and the firewall is enabled. Now, again, you can turn it off, but just know what the consequences are of that action. Man, I just used the word consequence and my kids just ran out of the room. <laughs> That's the word we use instead of grounding. But we've tried to teach them. And this is the same thing with users. And for yourself, there's good consequences and bad consequences. Every choice that you make has a consequence. Now, all of you, go to your room. Okay, so... In this module, we went through and we took a look at virus discovery methods, different ways that we discover viruses. And if you remember the three, there was the interception method, which is where we have software, sometimes hardware, that's in charge of notifying somebody that something's happened or intercepts some Trojan or virus or whatever malware it may be that's trying to make a change to our system. We also talked about scanning, and we talked about the signature strings that antivirus vendors use as well as code analysis to help come up with ways of protecting us from these pieces of malware that get released. And then we also talked about integrity checking. That is making sure that the main system files 
haven't been corrupted, save for example by a rootkit or any type of Trojan or malware at this point. And in particular, we talked about Tripwire and Sigverf. Remember, Sigverf is built into the OS. Tripwire is just a third-party product. And then we went through and took a look at the master list of countermeasures, which are just some overall best practices for you, which included things like coming up with a anti-malware policy. We also talked about looking at instructions when we're downloading files, or even, I should actually even say installing files, because I've seen some really weird things where in order to get something to work, they're telling you to turn off the UAC. And it was actually coming from a huge vendor. I want to say it was Dell. Or it could have been HP. Anyway, we also talked about that we should be scanning regularly and we should be scanning all the drives. We don't accept any disks or programs without making sure that they've been checked out first. Remember, I'm not a big fan of putting optical drives in desktop machines. We also talked about making sure that you keep up to date your knowledge up to date daily with what's going on in this world of malware. And I guess I should have mentioned this one too, but if you have a machine, we've talked about this in previous courses, but if you have a machine that has been compromised, do yourself a favor, don't trust it. Take it offline, wipe, format, and reinstall. Folks, that brings us to the end of this particular course. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed teaching it. You can probably see I'm pretty passionate when it comes to malware because it is the number one issue for us right now as far as security is concerned. It's how the attackers get in primarily. It is much easier for me as an attacker to go and create a piece of malware, send it to you, and you install it instead of me having to try to figure out a way in. In fact, if I'm really smart, I'm going to attach it to a piece of software and, and put it up as a torrent somewhere and see how many victims I can get. And it's usually after I teach this module that I get really paranoid, or I should say the paranoia inside of me increases. And again, my wife laughs at me because I'm so suspicious about everything. And as I keep telling her, hey, just because I don't see the black helicopters hovering overhead doesn't mean they're really not there. 